to see my pin number. Downloading it right now. No, you can't download that. Alright, it's Slayer time. And then I've been Slayered all over the place. Uh, do I want an Expeditious Bracelet? No, I think I'll just kill these guys normally. It's good training. Training. Let's forget to grab this. Um, boop, boop, or box, and... Boop, and one more for good measure. all arranged nice and smooth. Oh, except I grabbed the wrong freaking weapon, I just realized. The weapon master. You grabbed the wrong weapon. Why is Iga, Igor here to tell That's me about this? Halloween, bro. You've heard of Halloween? Professional potato. It's me. Uh, Halloween's tomorrow. I mean, it's basically Halloween. Yeah, freaking Morgan, baby! It. I need to buy some candy tomorrow. And by some, I literally mean like <laughs> very little amounts of candy, because no one comes to my house. You murder one group of uh, teenagers in the woods, and no one comes to your house again. They start calling it the. The murder house. Okay, well, but you're at a new house now, so. It's a soft. It's a soft sequel reboot. It's a soft C boot. Mm. Alright, what did I need to grab from my bank? Because I came back here for a reason. I grabbed. Why did I. Do I want to grab a prayer potion to have just in case? Probably. What are you playing? Uh, I'm doing uh, my weekly 12. That, that, that's a thing? Sword? Oh, oh. It's a thing P12. when I remember to get a... Yeah, P12. Oh, I remember now. I remember now that it's, it's too late. I wanted to grab an expeditious bracelet. In November of 2017, a Japanese train company issued a public apology after doing something truly unthinkable. 
An express train travelling to Tokyo from Ibaraki, about an hour north of the city, had been scheduled to depart the station at 9.44 a.m. But then they discovered something shocking. It turned out the train in question had actually left the station at 9.44 a.m. Oh my god, what were they thinking? I, uh, wait, what? Yes, it turns out the train left the station an astonishing 20 seconds me. early, departing at 9.44 and 20 seconds instead of the... Died to the unnatural enchainment and then, uh... Oh, God, no. And while the train company sincerely apologized for the inconvenience, despite no one actually complained... There came time to point the lasers, he came over and pointed his exactly where I was. ...apologizing for effectively leaving on time. After all, in the UK, train companies don't apologize... Gee, it's almost like I had been tanking until he walked over there. But I don't think I've ever met a foreigner visiting Japan who's experienced the country's shockingly efficient, clean, punctual public transport and not wanted to steal it and take it back home to their own country. Well, maybe apart from that one guy from Switzerland. Yeah. But when you come to Japan, you'll constantly feel jealous of all the great things the country has, and you're one dozen. Like a kid in a candy store. Oh, I want that one, Mum. I want edible ramen and futuristic robots. Oh, do shut up, child. We've got edible ramen and futuristic robots at home. Oh. So in this video, let's take a look at 12 ideas that we should steal from Japan. Some are physical inventions, others are ideas, concepts, and ways of thinking. And we've already got the low-hanging fruit that is public transport out of the way is number one. Now, the irony certainly isn't lost on me that this video is called 12 Things to Steal from Japan. And just this week, I made a video about a foreign YouTuber who literally stole things while he was in Japan. When I say steal, I mean in the metaphorical sense, to be inspired by it. It's a fucking shame that I should have to elaborate on that point. My God. So I was recently back in the UK, and one evening I was stood in the street eating a sausage roll, like you do, and thinking to myself, you know what, the UK isn't so bad after all. And then I witnessed a man walk over to an ATM cash register and just piss all over it. Oh. It was at that point I realised it was time to leave the UK once again. But over the years I've talked about how this is my favourite thing about Japan. People have a fundamental respect for public spaces. It's the reason you can sit peacefully on public transport and enjoy the ride without someone blaring out shite music on their phone speaker. You know, it's the reason Japanese media makes such a big deal when a YouTuber douchebag tears through the fabric of society. You know, just this month, a dickhead who licked a soy sauce bottle in a sushi restaurant received a three-year suspended prison sentence. They really don't fuck about. Now, I don't want to paint Japan as some sort of utopian society. The work culture and gender equality very much get in the way of that. But when it comes to public civility and safety, it really does come eerily close. And tragically, while most of the ideas on this list can be stolen or adopted overseas, this is one that is practically impossible. Now you might be thinking, well, this is my a dance partner Dumbing died. Down. Give me one word here, yes, sum it all up. And the closest I can find is kizukai, literally meaning thoughtfulness or consideration. It's kind of what underpins it all. But it has a broader meaning that's difficult to define, and so I went in search of Japan's top kizukai professor to get the best definition that I could. How do you explain kizukai in English? Very fucking difficult. It took three weeks to find that man, my god. So to wrap up the point, the best thing about Japan, public civility, is also the most notoriously difficult to steal. We'd have to literally appropriate an entire culture dating back 2,000 years, but hopefully you see why I chose it. Really, for this point, I should have just gone, let's steal vending machines. Oh, vending machines are good. You can dispense a drink, innit? Nice low-hanging fruit. And speaking of low-hanging fruit, I don't think this will be featuring. This is one singular banana wrapped in a bag. I don't know what's worse, this or the fact that a banana case is a thing. I haven't yet worked out if this is a good example of our faltering society. Or if it's actually an ingenious A good work takes. Let's find out. No, uh, the Parthenos no, on the limited platforms was just pointed so it hit the most the of the everything you could stand on. For. For a while now, I've been thinking of cutting off all contact with my friends outside of Japan for one reason, and one reason alone. Wagyu beef burgers. 
Oh my god, mate, it's Wagyu burgers, isn't it? Holy shit, dude, look how cheap this Wagyu is. Oh, fucking you, mate. Wagyu beef burgers at a reasonable price. Yes, it's almost as if it's not real Wagyu. Stop sending me bloody photos. Look at that sorry-looking burger. It should be in a fucking courtroom for crimes against humanity. Absolute disgrace. If you want to see what a real Wagyu burger looks like, I've got one right here in this bag. Look how greasy this is. More oil than Kuwait. We'll take a look at this a little bit later on. But first thing first, the Wagyu used to mean something truly special. Oh, I'll never forget the first time I sat down at a teppanyaki grill and watched it being meticulously prepared. Sizzling, buttery, rich smell, that melt-in-your-mouth texture. Hell, Natsuki invented a whole new phrase just to describe the experience of eating the stuff. Justice delicious. Justice delicious. No more, because foreign companies are taking the word Wagyu and slapping it on any crappy product they can to boost sales. Now I get it. The real thing is pretty damn rare, and it's certainly not cheap. A single cut of 200 grams of Matasaka beef will set you back 24,000 yen online, about $160. And that's typically why it's only eaten on special occasions. Like birthdays, yeah, which is why I make sure to have three birthdays every single year. Up until recently, it was notoriously difficult to get hold of Wagyu outside of so Japan. Because in 1997, Japan declared it a national treasure and started banning the export of Wagyu cow, and even their DNA to avoid poor imitations overseas. They went the extra distance. However, before that, some cows had snuck out of Japan, and even some companies genetically modified the cows to find the genetic trait that led to the prized fatty marble beef. And that is how you can get Australian or British or American Wagyu. And you know what? Sometimes, it's actually edible. But serve that crap in Japan and they'll laugh you out of a room. They do not see it as an authentic thing. In the same way a French winemaker from Champagne will bludgeon you to death with a stick if you claim any sparkling wine made outside of that area is Champagne. It's an insult to the production process. Japanese Kuroge black cattle are treated like royalty with their pure bloodlines. They're given names and allowed to roam free and sometimes even get a cheeky massage to help with stress painstakingly selectively bred for generations. Honestly, there's a reason it tastes so good. And the good news is Japan is actually trying to double exports to 300,000 tons by 2035. So you might be able to get your hands on the good stuff outside the country. Now let's eat a Wagyu beef burger, the real thing. This is a real Wagyu burger from a restaurant called Henry's Burger and it costs about a thousand yen for a single patty which given the fact it's real Kuroge Wagyu beef it's pretty incredible. It's on par with Shake Shack somehow, price point wise. Mm. Oh my god. All the thrills of eating a Wagyu steak but in a portable form factor. This is a revelation. My god I regret moving to Tokyo just because I can have this on tap. What was I thinking? Jesus. Mm. Now, this video is about ideas the world should steal from Japan. What about the sneaky individuals out there who want to steal from you? If, like me, you're constantly on the move using public Wi-Fi, keep that connection encrypted and hackers at bay with today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Imagine sitting in a cosy... Hello. Hi, good morning. Hello. 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 My wife left me. Again. I'm sorry to hear that. Is there anything I can do to help you? Don't touch me. I apologize if I made you uncomfortable. You did. Please let me know how can I assist you? Well, the uh, robots from the future might not be here just yet, but Japan is pretty damn innovative when it comes to employing robots in the workplace. And while most people know about sushi conveyor belts that we all know and love, or the little Shinkansen bullet train bringing you your fish, more recently family restaurants across the country have been rolling out clunky delivery robots that look like something out of a 1970s sci-fi film. And unlike having an awkward conversation with Pepper the robot, they get the job done pretty damn well. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, I don't want my job taken by some bloody robot. I'm the best there is, goddammit. What do I say? Wait a minute. It's not always the case that the robots are taking people's jobs. For example, a lot of these family restaurants, whether it's Gusto, Denny's, Coco's, out in more rural areas, are really struggling to find staff in the face of depopulation, and the robots kind of help fill that role. Not only that, but robots can be used as avatars to help people that wouldn't normally be able to work. Case in point, the most inspiring example of using robots in the workplace is in the Dawn Avatar Robot Cafe here in Tokyo. A restaurant staffed entirely by robots, controlled and operated by disabled people from their homes, giving opportunities to people who may struggle or simply be unable to find work. Meanwhile, at the Henna Hotel, robots are staffing the front desk, and in one respect, they're quite good in the sense that they're bilingual. They can operate in three or four languages, even though they are undeniably fucking frightening and that's the last thing you want to see when you arrive jet-lagged at a Tokyo hotel when they rolled out the first robot hotel I think 2017 I went there 
and filmed it and a lot of it didn't actually work but since then Henna Hotels have really improved it and it's become one of the most popular hotel brands throughout the country, particularly with foreign tourists. So even though Japan might not always get it right with their robots, at least they're finding new ways to innovate and improve the customer experience using robots. And with Japan's tech sector declining a little bit in the face of competition from South Korea and China, it's one innovative edge the country still has going for it. When I was looking for my first apartment in Sendai, it was an absolute nightmare to find somewhere that would allow foreigners. And I finally found one that seemed pretty nice on the surface, until I got to the back, where there was a tatami mat room similar to this, with the shoji door completely shredded to pieces, as though it was straight out of a horror movie. It was almost as if something was trying to claw its way out um, pretty unsuccessfully. Now some say the apartment was haunted, tormented by evil spirits. Others say that it was the three-year-old child running rampant with the scissors. Who knows what to believe? Either way, I got the apartment and thankfully they replaced the shoji doors. So they look like this. Well, not this bad. I mean, these ones up here look tea-stained as though somebody's been physically sick or spilt something. And that's the first thing I love about shoji doors. They tell a story, albeit a fairly grim story here, but it's that ethereal glow, especially in the morning. It's the perfect way to wake up. And you know, many ryokans, many traditional inns in Japan don't have curtains. So you sort of wake up naturally with the morning light. Now they're not perfect. Um, this one might be intentionally stained for dramatic effect, but there is one over there that's torn and ripped, and that certainly wasn't intentional. That's what happens when you let a drunken friend into your brand new studio. Never, ever again. Wow. When I was back in the UK, Okay, over the summer I did a book signing and I met about 500 people. It was a lot of fun, a lot of people, but I asked each and every person the same question when I met them and that was, where are you from mate, In it? And I got different answers, they were from Leeds, Nottingham, London. But when I asked them the next question, which is, what are those places like? What's it like where you're from? They always came up with the same answer and the answer was, they're shit. Now maybe that's a pessimistic British thing, I don't know. It turned out the only place in the UK that people are actually proud to be from is uh, Shropshire. So well done Shropshire, I don't know, don't know what goes on there but it must be good. But when you ask a Japanese person where they're from, quite the opposite. They'll actually be proud of their hometown, they'll have a sort of nostalgic fondness from the place that they're from. Where are you from? Hiroshima. Is it good? Of course. It's a testament to how towns in Japan make their locals actually feel part of something bigger, make them feel part of the community. And one way they do that every year is through festivals. Now you might be thinking, look dickhead, you can't appropriate a Japanese ancient festival dating back literally thousands of years, mate, in it. To which I say, but wait, many of the festivals don't date back, again, quite as far as you think. Take the Fertility Festival, beloved by Jeremy the Anime Man. It dates back to just 1969. <laughs> nice. There's also my favourite festival, the Tachi Deputy Festival in Almore, with the tallest floats in all of Japan, towering 23 metres above the city. That only dates back to 1996. And when the first festival was over, to celebrate this majestic artwork that they created over many months, you know, painstakingly built, they did what any good town would do. They incinerated it in a field. They burnt it alive. I don't know why, if I'd been there working on it, I'd have been very, very disappointed. But there's also the Funeko Nagashi Boat Festival in Aomori, where every year they construct beautiful, elaborate boats. And then they burn them. They burn them in the river. They burn them all. Why do Japanese festivals need to burn everything? I don't understand. But the point is, festivals are fun, and they bring the community together. You get to burn things. Now, I'm not saying we steal these specific festivals. Though it could be quite fun, especially the fertility one. What I'm saying is we embrace the locality of our own town. For example, the town that I'm from in England is called Maidstone. And in 1897, we had what was then the largest ever typhoid epidemic in England in the 19th century. You know, what better unique historic events reenact and celebrate every year than the typhoid epidemic. But honestly, I've never seen local communities in Japan come together like they do when there's a festival. The elderly, the schools, the kids, everyone gets stuck in. And I want to steal that feeling of pride that they have. I want to steal that sense of belonging. Perhaps above all, I want to burn it all in a field. I want to burn it in a field for fun. Maybe that's why I want the festivals. I'm a pyromaniac at heart. Uh, 
somebody who spends their time often on the road in hotel rooms, this is my favourite thing. You ready? <laughs> Spilling water all over the floor. You can do it, but it seems trivial. It seems even sad by some accounts. But spill water on the bathroom floor in the UK. Watch it seep through the floorboards and get ready to check out your home insurance policy. Here, you don't have to worry about that. Here, you can splash water wherever you want, all over the floor, all over the $3,000 cinema camera. Oh. Japanese hotel rooms often feel like there's an anomaly, as though the bathroom hasn't so much been built into the room as simply dropped in, and that's because it often has. The bathroom is a self-contained wet room made of prefabricated plastic, like that, where you've got your bathtub, your shower, your sink and toilet all included in one very tiny space. In fact, I've had to break the rules of physics to be able to get inside this damn thing, contort and break my legs. I actually think I might be stuck, but I'll, I'll deal with that later. But they make very good use of the space. The tap for the basin is also the tap for the bath. And while the size varies, the one consistency in Japanese hotels is you know the bathroom will be functional. Unlike many hotels around the world where a good bathroom in a two or three star hotel often feels like a nightmarish lottery. The idea of the wet room goes back to the Japanese household, where many family members share the same bath water. By first showering in this space here, hence the drainage plug down there, and then getting into the bath already clean. And even if you're not sold on the soulless but functional bathroom, there is one innovation I do think we should steal, and that is the toilet. No, not the washlet either. I'll never forget when I moved into my first apartment and I went into the toilet to find a wash basin built into the toilet itself. The idea being you wash your hands in the basin and that water goes through to rinse the toilet. I am stealing Junior's rocks right now. Water, that would probably save okay. the world an awful lot of wasted water if adopted universally. These guys do have a decent drop, but uh, it's not super important. <clears throat> it would be nice to have the leaf bladed battle axe. One out of a thousand. When I check into a Japanese hotel, the bathroom is going to be functional. Get the job done. I want to steal these. Oh, that might be rare enough for you to actually get. <laughs> that being said, I actually think I've. It's a convenience crush weapon. I can't move. I've killed uh, over. I just only do this when I have the tasks, but I've killed 581. Of course, my tasks. So. Whatever. <laughs> it happens, it happens. And now it's time for an impromptu quiz. Question one, to risk it all, what percentage of Japan's population owns a passport? Is it A, 65%? Is it B, 25%? Or is it C, get out of my kitchen, why am I doing an impromptu quiz? And the answer is B, 25%. Isn't that crazy for a country that has what's considered to be the best passport in the world for visa-free travel? Only 25% have a passport. I guess one of the reasons is domestic travel within Japan is actually very good. And I think there's one reason above all that exploring the country can be very rewarding, dare I say, very filling indeed. Mibutsu means famous product or famous dish. And it's a really handy word to know. If you ever travel somewhere new in Japan, you can say, Mibutsu are nandesuka. What's the local dish here? But Mibutsu is done on a truly astonishing scale here, where each and every one of Japan's 47 prefectures has at least one local dish or confectionery that it's famous for. For example, Miyagi Prefecture in Sendai, where I used to live, the local dish there is guta, literally cow tum, and it's a uh, lot more delicious than it sounds. Osaka is famous for okonomiyaki pancakes, of course. And Iwate has wanker saber noodles that I'm still recovering from with mild to moderate PTSD. Now, not all meibutsu are inherently good. Nagano's meibutsu is hachinoko, literally bee larvae. And we saw how that turned out for Natsuki when he attempted to consume that jar of horrendous, pasty, awful stuff. <coughs> Now you might be thinking, you charming moron, you can't just invent a cuisine overnight. These meibuts should date back thousands of years, which is bollocks, because Kyoto's most popular meibuts is called yatsuhashi, and they're sweets that are just 30, 40 years old. And many of Japan's most popular dishes only date back to the post-war era, such as the aforementioned gyutan or okonomiyaki pancakes. But what I love about meibuts is it kind of turns Japan into one big RPG, but there's a real incentive to go out and explore the country and kind of try all these new dishes. And you might be thinking, well, how do you learn about them? How do people know about these hundreds, if not thousands, of dishes around the country? And that is the genius part where Japanese TV comes in. As you may already know, Japanese TV obsesses over food like no other. In fact, it's estimated an incredible 40% of programming on TV here is focused on food. It's the ultimate marketing tool. And many of these shows are actually funded by the food or agricultural industry. But this cycle of creating a local dish and then marketing it over TV can have an incredible economic effect in more rural kind of areas. 
I mean, take Wanker Soba Noodles, for example. Most tourists would never go to Morioka, as lovely as it is. Because of those noodles, people make the pilgrimage two and a half hours north of Tokyo. But it's not just the local dishes that I want to steal. It's the place you eat them as well. And one very cozy type of place in particular. Imagine if a maze, a pub crawl, and your grand's cozy kitchen all had a baby. Welcome to Yokocho, Japan's answer to a night out where you might need a map to navigate between all the tiny bars, but by the third stop, you probably won't care too much. Mm. Yokocho literally meaning side and street, a narrow alleyways lined with various small bars and restaurants where the concept of personal space is simply a myth. Perhaps the best known ones are in Shinjuku, like Amuide Yokocho, literally memory lane, with 60 bars sandwiched between two alleyways, or Golden Guy, which looks like a cyberpunk wet dream. Make no mistake, Yokocho are pretty damn intense, as you literally rub shoulders alongside other customers in a hot, humid environment, with your face mere inches from the grill behind the bar. But of course, odds are, if you're looking for a luxury dining experience, you won't be going to a Yokocho in the first place. You go because there's nothing else quite like it, but the cramped atmosphere, the good food, and the fact you can speak with the owner who's there tending to the customers behind the bar. Hello. Nice guy. And more often than not, it's the owner who's the main draw card. I mean, Ryota and I once made a video in the town of Hachinor here, in far-flung Aomori, and people travelled across the region to meet the charismatic owner of the bar there, a hilarious woman who really, really wanted me to eat horse meat. Horse power! <laughs> But because Yorkshire restaurants are so small, it means budding entrepreneurs and chefs can you know, test out the waters and start small. And in more recent years, they've even played a role in rejuvenating the economies of rural areas where the nightlife scene is on the decline. And as you sit packed in a tiny room alongside six or seven people eating delicious food and feeling undeniably claustrophobic, hopefully you'll see the appeal as well. But maybe I'm a little bit biased, given that the food you'll find most commonly in Yorkshire happens to be the next thing I want to steal from Japan. Right, I know what you're probably thinking here. You just added this point in yakitori because you wanted a tax deductible way to eat your favourite Japanese dish. That's nonsense, heinous, hideous lies. I would never, ever do that. <clears throat> to which I say, it's not actually the yakitori chicken that I want to steal, it's a key ingredient required in making yakitori, and that's what I want to steal. More on that in a minute. But when I tell people I love yakitori, they're always kind of like, well, it's just the simplest, most boring dip, it's chicken on a skewer. And I get it, putting some chicken on a stick over some charcoal is hardly bloody rocket science. And yet somehow, when walking the streets of the UK, you are more likely to run into a rocket scientist than you are into a good yakitori skewered restaurant. Yakitori, literally meaning grilled and burned, is the simplest of dishes. Take a juicy cut of chicken, the breast, the thigh, the liver, the heart, the skin, the tail, and gently grill it over a charcoal grill, intermittently turning it, fanning it, seasoning it, and, well, yeah, all right, it's not as easy as it seems, to be honest. But a few years ago, the most critically acclaimed, award-winning restaurant in all of Japan was a yakitori restaurant hidden away in the central Japan Alps. It became so damn popular, you could only get in with an invite from a local. And I can assure you, I've never tried so hard to befriend the locals of a rural Japanese village. Suffice to say, I was unsuccessful. Wow. But even if I stole the idea of yakitori and tried to set up my own restaurant in the UK, there's one thing that might hold me back, one thing that would stop this from happening. And it all comes down to Japan's secret weapon, the highest quality charcoal on earth. Pincho Town is typically white in appearance and burns longer and with more intensity than regular black charcoal. Simply put, if you were being roasted alive by cannibals, this is the one charcoal you wouldn't want them to use. But because of its high carbon, it produces little smoke as it burns. Meaning unlike regular barbecues, where the food can have a bitter char-grilled taste, Bincho Town imparts no additional flavour or aroma on the chicken, meaning it unlocks the full, juicy, meaty flavour of each cup. And Jesus Christ, I'm starting to feel hungry just thinking about it. Oh, God. Bincho Town. It's the future. Bincho Town is the reason Japanese yakitori has the edge. But for that alone, it's worthy of stealing to unlock the magic of the nation's simplest but purest dish. God bless tax-deductible yakitori. And you know, before I moved to Tokyo, back when I was in Sendai, when I filmed in the studio, I'd often go to a yakitori restaurant round the corner once a week, and I'd sit alone and devour 20 skewers of chicken. It was practically a bloody ritual, and uh, yes, I was alone. And that is actually one of the next things I'd like to steal from Japan. In most countries, when you walk into a restaurant, the first question you get is, oh, how many customers? And if you go, oh, one please, you get 
the look. The look of, oh, one of those customers. <laughs> oh, you can almost hear the sad soundtrack playing overhead. As if the people around you were taunting you, judging you, no less. What's the matter, mate? Got no fucking friends. <laughs> Don't know why they sound like Joe. But meanwhile, Japan is optimised for solo dining. Go into any restaurant, and it's not an uncommon sight to witness diners eating or drinking alone, hunched over a counter at a sushi restaurant or an izakaya pub or a bar. Hell, it's your round ramen even have individual booths, meaning you don't even need to look at another filthy customer while you enjoy your ramen. Though Ichiran has given the concept a somewhat questionable name of a flavour concentration booth. Sounds like a form of torture, but many restaurants have adopted this idea, with family restaurants now with their solo seats, and even Yakiniku meat grilling restaurants where solo customers get their own private grill. But fundamentally, when I'm travelling Japan, I like the fact that if I'm alone, it doesn't limit my options in a way it kind of would in the West, right? I can walk into any restaurant, and when somebody goes, oh, nanme sama this how many people. I could go, oh, story on a guy shamas, and they don't go, oh, oh, I see. <laughs> oh, dear. And let's face it, it is especially convenient because I also have no friends as well. But that is the twelfth and final thing that I want to steal from Japan. But what do you want to steal the most? I think if I had to choose one on this list, it would be Kizukai. I think having a society that functions as one is really essential. And uh, no. Actually, fuck that. Who am I kidding? It would be Wagyu burgers. Of course it would be Wagyu burgers. But let me know in the comments which one you would choose. As always, guys, for more behind-the-scenes content, check out the Abroad Japan Patreon. And until then, I'll see you right back here to do it all over again next time on Abroad in Japan. As for me... Hi, I'm Sh and the Spanish Habsburgs. There was eventually a war of Spanish succession in 1700 and a war of Austrian succession in 1740. We don't need to go into those, you're welcome, but suffice it to say, by the middle of the 18th century, Austria was the Habsburgs' home turf. Austria was much larger then than compared to the modern nation of Austria. There were more changes after the Holy Roman Empire was abolished by Napoleon in 1806 and still more in 1867 when the country of Austria officially became Austria-Hungary. We'll get there. It's a mess. Leaf-bladed battle axe, baby! Let's have a go! I got it, Talon. Woohoo! I heard. But. Oh no, wait, no, no, no. Yeah, this does increase damage to these guys. Nice. Die, you curb. Pick it up and immediately start using it. Filthy curass baskers. Baskerdirds. Because I don't think the leaf bladed sword has a bonus, it just can hit them. Yeah. So are they weaker to crush or slash? Equally resistant. It's kind of amusing. <laughs> why, why, do they why do they drop an item they resist? Maybe that's why they're holding on to it. They're like the stupid adventures. But they don't know. They don't know about my damage bonus. They don't know. What if you got a second one? That'd be that kind of be not necessary. <laughs> I'm being honest. I just still wield them now. Thank <laughs> you. 
big numbers. What if your numbers were big? Sounds like God Gamer. but I'll kill this guy first, he's here. Mass is the history of Germany's royal and imperial family, the Hohenzollerns. There are several branches of this family, and the complexity is compounded by the various small princedoms, duchies, and counties that they ruled beginning in the Middle Ages. To try to make it simple, the earliest known noble ancestor of the Hohenzollerns was Burkhard I, born in the early 11th century. Unlike their opposite numbers, the Habsburgs, the Hohenzollerns' corporate strategy was not to try to seep into the ruling class of the Holy Roman Empire, but rather to snatch up as many of those small princedoms and duchies as possible. The most significant branch of the family, for our purposes at least, eventually established themselves in two important areas. Brandenburg, which includes Berlin, and on whose throne a Hohenzollern first sat down in 1415, and Prussia, to the east of Brandenburg, which the Hohenzollern family became the Dukes of, beginning in 1525. Brandenburg and Prussia basically merged in 1618. After the devastation of the Thirty Years' War, which ended in 1648, the Hohenzollerns, now synonymous with Prussia, became extraordinarily powerful, especially because of their standing army, an institution developed there in 1653. Prussian militarism becomes an important thread of our story going forward. During the long run-up to German unification in the 19th century, which I'll get to in Chapter 4, there was some question about who, if there was to be a unified Germany, was going to be in it, and who was going to rule it. By the time unification occurred in 1871, the Hohenzollerns were the long-entrenched kings of Prussia. It got promoted from a duchy to a kingdom in 1701, and when Germany suddenly became a thing, the king of Prussia suddenly became the emperor of Germany. Nice how these promotions work, isn't it? At least for them. The Romanovs are fortunately much simpler. At least they're contained in one country. That country, of course, is Russia. In fact, I'm going to take care of the Romanovs pretty quickly, in only two paragraphs of my script. Ivan IV, also known as Ivan the Terrible, was the first czar of all the Russias. Yes, in the 16th century there was more than one. Anyway, after his bloody reign, he died in 1584 without a clear successor. And there was a period of immense political chaos, which the Russians call the Time of Troubles. In 1613, the boyars, the landed nobles, decided to try to end this chaos by giving the throne to someone Do I want to order tacos on the bell? Is it a Taco Bell night? Sure, if you're feeling it. Be good. Are you ever really feeling it? Are you really feeling it? I don't know. Uh, oh.
Why shouldn't I order it? Go for some tacos. Only eat a couple. At least tangentially related to Ivan's family, whom everybody could agree on as the rightful czar and stop fighting over the throne. The kid they found, yes, he was a kid, he was only 16. The kid they found to give the crown to was Mikhail Romanov, who was tangentially related by marriage to family. He was crowned the Tsar of Russia, sorry, the Tsar of all the Russias, in 1613. Not all the succeeding Romanov rulers were blood descendants of him. Catherine the Great, who ruled in the second half of the 18th century, was related by marriage, not blood, but they, the Romanovs did manage to keep the crown in the family right up to the bitter end. No less than three chapters of this video are devoted to the various Russian revolutions. Yes, there was more than one, so we'll hear plenty more about the Romanovs later. The Osmanli dynasty, let's just call them Ottomans, is unique because this one family held power throughout the entire existence of their country, the Ottoman Empire. The whole family, right down to the How is this? 6th and 20th this is century, the animation doesn't even look right. Why is this one handed? It looks like a two handed weapon. And was regarded as the founder of the empire. I guess I'm very there were powerful. various clans of Turks who ruled Anatolia it's and big 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 for one ages. Weapon. My seven one hand weapon. My seventh graders have to distinguish between the Seljuk Turks, who reached the height of their power in the 11th century, and the Ottoman Turks, who came later. But fortunately, we don't have to go into that. The Ottomans rose in power throughout the 14th and early 15th centuries, but they really cemented their empire in place when Mehmet II conquered Constantinople in 1453, extinguishing what little was left by that time of the Byzantine Empire. The Ottomans were definitely practitioners of the divine right of kings idea. In addition to being the head of state of the empire, which eventually stretched from Central Europe to North Africa and the borders of Persia, the Ottoman Sultan was also the Caliph, the ostensible head of the whole religion of Islam, recognized at least by some Muslims as the successor of the Prophet Muhammad. The Ottomans had a bizarre procedure to determine the succession of power, unique among these families. Essentially, the Ottoman Sultan had as many sons as possible, and when he died, the sons duked it out for power, and the one left standing became the new Sultan. One Sultan, Mehmet III, had no less than 19 of his little brothers executed. Strangling, or if they were very young, drowning them in bathtubs was a favorite means of royal execution in the Ottoman Empire. Sometimes these power struggles didn't even wait for the Sultan's death to break out. Because the Ottoman Sultans had a gigantic harem of concubines and often sons by many different women, power struggles behind the Ottoman throne, especially among the mothers and sisters of various claimants, were epic and often very bloody. Finally, we have China's ruling family, the Isinjioro family. To understand who they were, 
and R, you have to understand a little bit about the various historic ethnicities within China. The largest one is the Han. The Isengioros, who were not Han Chinese, were in the mid 16th century one of several competing clans among the Jurchen people who lived on the northeastern fringe of China, the part that would later become known as Manchuria. These people weren't Mongols, but they were heavily influenced by them. We don't need to go into all of that. All you need to know is that a powerful warlord of this clan, called Nurhachi, united several of these tribes of people and became emperor, not of China, but of Manchuria, the neighboring state to China proper, which was then ruled by the decaying Ming dynasty. Indeed, Jurchens became known as Manchus. If you're an Indiana Jones fan, you've heard of Nurhachi. It's said to be his remains in the little jade jar that appears in the opening sequence of the second film, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom in the Shanghai nightclub. A character identifies him correctly as the first emperor of the Manchu dynasty. Remember that Mandate of Heaven concept? Well, by the 1640s, many in China thought the Ming, who had ruled since the 14th century, had lost it. Nurhachi died in 1636, but a couple of years later, his son, Hong Taishi, completed the project that his father had begun, which was to topple the Ming rulers and take over China in their place. After a complicated series of military campaigns and revolts, the Changshen Emperor, Zhu Yuzhan, hanged himself on April 25, 1644, in Beijing. The Manchus took advantage of the situation and claimed they'd snatched up the Mandate of Heaven for themselves. Hong Taishi was the first emperor of the newly proclaimed Qing dynasty. Historians date the beginning of that dynasty from 1644, but in reality it took decades for the Manchus to complete their conquest of China. The Isengioro clan intermarried heavily with Han Chinese nobles, landowners, and military leaders, but the crown stayed in the family from 1644 right down to the end of the dynasty and the end of monarchical China in 1912. It's important to note that toward the very end, the Dowager Empress, Xi Shi, who effectively controlled China from 1861 to 1908, was not technically the crowned ruler of China. She was not a member of the Isengioro clan, at least by blood, but she was the power behind the throne, who ruled through a series of puppet emperors, including her sons. Puyi, the last emperor, whom she put on the throne while on her deathbed in 1908, was an Isengioro. In the 17th and especially the 18th century in Europe, a sort of intellectual revolution occurred. It's usually called the Enlightenment, and whenever historians talk about it, they start name dropping. Dang, I just said a 51. Voltaire, Rousseau, <laughs> David Hume, guys in wigs, usually English or French, who like to stand around in Baroque salons, babbling about the rights of man or the rule of reason or something like that. I want to spare you all of that. The take home point is that during this period, Western society essentially turned away from medieval ways of thinking and doing things toward a more rationalist worldview. This change had a lot of different facets. People like Isaac Newton and Christian Huygens were pushing the boundaries of physical and mathematical sciences. Holland, with its semi-democratic constitution, its great wealth from overseas trade, and its flowering of artists and painters was remaking European culture. The Protestant Reformation of the 16th century and the religious wars of the 17th century had remade Christianity and religious thought. In the American colonies, a religious revival called the Great Awakening gave rise to lots of new modes of worship. And of course, the Enlightenment had a political dimension. Cue the guys in white wigs. Between 1754 and 1763, the world was convulsed by a truly global conflict between two great empires, the British and the French, and their various allies and colonies. The aftermath of this war, and especially the fiscal crisis that it sparked in Britain, eventually led to a lot of important consequences, such as the dumping of a lot of tea into Boston Harbor and several events depicted in the musical Hamilton. For purposes of the story I'm telling here, the American Revolution is less important as a major blow to the power of monarchies, despite what the Declaration of Independence says in its 
long train of abuses section, it was more of a revolt against the British Parliament, which made policy, than the British King, whose actual power was somewhat less than Jefferson's political prose seemed to suggest. But the American Revolution is important as a stepping stone to the French Revolution, which certainly does have a lot to do with our story. The King of France, Louis XVI, had reached deep into the pockets of the nation to finance France's support of the revolt of the American colonies against the British. When that was over, France too was in financial crisis. The nobles who owned the land and all the wealth in France were mostly exempt from taxes due to hereditary privilege. The tax burden and many other financial hardships fell on the backs of the peasants. Enlightenment era political thought and good old fashioned class resentment blew France to smithereens in 1789. This revolution, much more than the American one, truly terrified the remaining crown heads of Europe. The French Revolution worked an important change into the way people, at least many in Western Europe, thought of themselves and their nations. Previous to the French Revolution, the nation of France was defined as that which belonged to the King of France. Any French person was defined as someone who owed their allegiance to the King of France. After the French Revolution, France was increasingly defined as the nation of the French people, and a French person was someone who had certain things in common with other people who were French, an identity, whether political or cultural or both. As a result, where power came from and how a government claimed legitimacy also changed. What's the evidence for this? Well, for starters, look at how ordinary French citizens joined the army in great numbers in the 1790s to go fight France's enemies. Not because a king called them to service, there was no king anymore, but because they felt they owed a duty to defend the French nation. The chaos of the French Revolution gave way to the dictatorship of Napoleon. And that really proves how the definitions of nations and sovereignty had changed. Napoleon didn't set himself up on the throne of France as simply a successor to the Bourbon dynasty. In 1804, he proclaimed himself the emperor of the French. He presented himself as the defender and avenger of the interests and values of the French Revolution. Liberty, equality, and fraternity, however imperfectly Napoleon's somewhat erratic government tried to bring those ideas to life. Napoleon scrambled the map of Europe and the world. He abolished the Holy Roman Empire in 1806, which left Prussia and Austria the big dogs in German-speaking Europe. His bungled attempts to take over Spain triggered the revolt of Spain's former colonies in the New World, and his failed invasion of Russia ended up strengthening the autocratic rule of the Tsar, Alexander I. Poland, Napoleon called it the Duchy of Warsaw, again vanished from the map of Europe its lands given mostly to Russia or Austria. Napoleon was defeated and exiled twice, first in 1814, sent to Elba, from which he escaped, and again a year later after his epic clowning at the Battle of Waterloo. The victorious European powers, principally Britain, Prussia, Austria, and Russia, three of our five monarchical dynasties gathered in Vienna to try to clean up the mess that Napoleon had made of Europe. The victorious powers were horrified at what the French Revolution had done to the political order. At the Congress of Vienna in 1814 and 1815, they couldn't really put the genie of revolutionary ideas back in the bottle, but they sure as hell tried. In the decades after 1815, Austria, Russia, and Prussia all became more autocratic, not less, and their monarchies became even more stilted, ossified, and resistant to new ideas. I've already discussed three revolutions in this chapter. The intellectual one, called the Enlightenment, the American Revolution, and the French Revolution. Here's the fourth, the Industrial Revolution. New advances in science and engineering, and also financial and economic technology that enabled the rise of corporate capital, got parlayed into new industries, like textiles in England, and eventually heavy industry, like railroads and steamships. The Industrial Revolution changed everything. It changed how goods were made and sold, 
it enabled countries to grow a whole lot more food to feed themselves with a whole lot fewer people actually engaged in the business of farming. Steamships could go up rivers and medicines that could treat or prevent tropical diseases enabled European countries to develop colonies in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. Cities exploded in population. As the American Civil War of the 1860s proved, industrialization made weapons a lot more deadly. This was a bad time for the monarchies to be reaching for the past rather than trying to navigate their way into the future. In 1848, a new wave of revolution broke across Europe. France's rickety post-Napoleon government fell. A sort of attempt was made at unifying Germany, but the project broke apart on the two big rocks that always seemed to keep it from coming off. First, was Austria going to be a part of it? And second, who was going to rule it? China was not having a good century. The various European revolutions didn't touch it, but internal decay and the predatory practices of Western powers, especially Britain, had a corrosive effect. Seeking a way back, to another leaf bladed sword. Its lopsided trade deficit with China. Is this is where's the X? Getting no. as many Chinese as I think they're hooked on opium. 256 India. And the Chinese politely three. asked No, the they're Of course not. They're 3 1 out of 384. Very normal number for normal people. The frick? Three eighty four. What the, what's the Drugs, point in that number? The British answer back with cannonballs. Two opium wars, one beginning in 1839, the other in 1858, deeply weakened the Qing military and economy. To make matters worse, in 1850, the largest internal revolt in Chinese history, the Taiping Rebellion, broke out in the countryside. It was fueled by a Chinese mystic and revolutionary who claimed to be the brother of Jesus Christ. This rebellion, which was not put down until 1864, killed 30 million people, equaling or exceeding the body count of the First World War. The Ottomans weren't doing quite that badly, but the 19th century was no picnic for them either. The Ottoman policy of mostly ignoring the modern world wasn't really working out, especially as global economic patterns changed. The Ottoman Empire was plagued with revolts too, which Western powers sometimes exploited. Serbia revolted in 1804, Greece in 1821, the weakening of Ottoman rule in North Africa enabled France to snap up Algeria in the 1830s. As the Ottomans faded in strength, Russia started throwing its weight around. A demand by Russia in the early 1850s that the Ottomans allow it, Russia, to be the protector of all Orthodox Christians in the Ottoman Empire led to a war between Russia on one side and Britain, France, and the Ottomans on the other, the Crimean War from 1853 to 1856. Though the Ottomans were ostensibly on the winning side, Britain and France were mainly trying to block Russia's expansionism, not help them. If the Ottomans went down, the British and French feared that Russia might take over Constantinople, the cherished warm water port that Russian rulers often coveted. So, by the 1860s, although Europe was mostly at peace, with some occasional exceptions, the continent was pretty much a mess. The next big development was Germany. And I finally mean capital G Germany, which did not exist as a unified country before 1871, but whose appearance on the scene pretty much turned the world upside down. That's in the next chapter. <laughs> In the first decades of the 19th century, there were two new cultural and political developments in Europe. One was Romanticism. It's easy to think of this as mainly a movement in art and aesthetics, and some of its prime examples are in art, like these paintings you've been looking at. But Romanticism, a sort of nostalgia for a more perfect and usually imagined past, a reaction to the rationalism of the Enlightenment, took many forms. You can find it in architecture, in music, and, believe it or not, in politics. Romanticism's close political cousin was nationalism, the second big development. In the early 19th century, lots of people, especially ethnic groups in Central and Eastern Europe, started thinking and talking about how groovy it would be if they had nations of their own. 
Many of them lived under the Austrian Empire, the Russian Empire, or parts of German-speaking Central Europe that had been scrambled by Napoleon and badly unscrambled by the Congress of Vienna. Now, nationalism, of course, existed in other countries too. Phrases like, God bless America, vive la France, or the sun never sets on the British Empire are all essentially nationalistic slogans. The point is, this kind of sentiment was much rarer before the early 19th century. The French Revolution, Napoleon, and the revolutions of 1848 made it mainstream. Nationalistic sentiment was especially important among people who spoke German or who saw themselves as culturally German. There were baby steps toward unification of Germany as early as 1818, right after the Napoleon Mishigas, when the Prussians started to move toward dropping customs duties on goods imported from various other German states. That eventually became formalized in an arrangement called the Zollverein, a customs union, kind of like a predecessor of some of the customs rules uh, that are common today within the European Union. The Zollverein went into effect formally in 1834. As I mentioned in the last chapter, there was an attempt at German unification during the turmoil of 1848. In fact, a proto-legislature called the Frankfurt Parliament offered Friedrich Wilhelm IV, the King of Prussia, the proposed office of Emperor of Germany in early 1849. He politely declined. There were still too many details that hadn't been worked out and too many potential traps, especially whether Austria or Russia would even allow it. After 1848, the big question was if there was to be a unified Germany, monster, so. would Austria be a but that's okay. it? If yes, it essentially would have been a merger of Austria and Prussia. The Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns would have to share power. Yeah, not likely to work out too well, given this lot. Then, in the 1860s, Otto von Bismarck appeared on the scene as Prussia's chancellor, basically kind of like the prime minister. History teachers love Otto von Bismarck. I could spend nine or ten hours blabbing about Bismarck and what he did, and of course I'm not going to. I'm just going to skip to the end. You're welcome. After Prussia fought three short wars, one with Denmark, one with Austria, and one with France, the Prussians were dominant enough and audacious enough to proclaim a unified German Empire without Austria. This was done in this room, the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, in January 1871. Got a nice axe. The King of Prussia got a promotion to the Emperor of Germany. Pretty much instantly, with its heavy industry and its powerful professional army, both largely inherited from Prussia, Germany was the most economically and militarily powerful country on the continent of Europe. This upset the delicate balance of power that the wigged heads at the Congress of Vienna had tried to establish in 1815. History teacher and fellow history YouTuber Mr. Betts has a great way to describe this in his video about the causes of World War I. Adding a unified Germany to Europe, he says, is like putting a tomato in a fruit salad. Yes, technically a fruit, but boy, does it change the whole dish. Italy was also unified in this period for much the same reason, nationalism. I'm not gonna get into that at all. Again, you're welcome. While all this was going on, Austria had its own problems, principally with Hungary. The historical relationship between Austria and the Kingdom of Hungary, going back to the 16th century, is complex. If they were people, they might have considered going to a support group for people trapped in toxic codependent relationships. Hungary was sort of attached to Austria, but also separate for some purposes, and often resented the attachment. In 1848, when Franz Joseph came to the throne of Austria and found his power threatened by the revolutions going on that year, he proclaimed a new constitution for the whole of his empire, which he insisted included Hungary. Hungary, which tried unsuccessfully to establish its formal independence in 1848, found itself just another province of the Austrian Empire, and essentially under military domination. Only now, nationalism was an even bigger thing than it ever had been before. The Hungarians naturally wanted their own country now more than ever. In 1866, 
Austria was defeated by Prussia in one of those German unification wars. The war and several other missteps over the past decade or so had bankrupted Austria. Hungary was again threatening to break away, but as their relationship was codependent, they couldn't quite do it. Hungarian politicians reached a compromise with the Austrian Emperor Franz Josef. Hungary was still part of the empire, but had kind of a special autonomy. From 1867 on, when the compromise was ratified, the former Austrian Empire was now known as Austria-Hungary. But the problems in this kind of Frankenstein empire were even worse because there were a lot more ethnic groups who were out there waving flags and wishing for a country of their own, or at least some kind of country where they didn't have to take orders from Vienna. Bohemians, Slovenians, Slovakians, Czechs, and more types of Slavic peoples than Baskin Robbins has ice cream flavors. Austria-Hungary had a unique problem with ethnic minorities wanting independence because they generally had more ethnic minorities in their borders than almost anyone else in Europe except maybe Russia. Slavs wanting a country specifically for Slavs, dare one name it, a Yugoslavia, was a political force that was continually destabilizing for Austria-Hungary. In fact, this sentiment has a lot to do with what Gavrilo Princip was doing on that street corner in Sarajevo in June 1914. Say it with me, remember that, it becomes important later. Finally, things weren't going so well in Russia either. Russia, under the later Romanovs, was the most autocratic and least modern country in Europe. While cities were expanding and factories were pumping out steel in Western Europe, Russia still had serfdom, the old medieval system, where peasants were bound to the land and forced to farm it for the landowners, as if the entire Renaissance and early modern period had never happened. Indeed, laws were passed in Russia in the early 17th century specifically to prevent serfdom from dying out, as it had already done, or was well on its way to doing, in most other parts of Europe. Still, even in Russia, it was clear by the mid-19th century that this feudal and medieval system simply couldn't work in an era of modern economics that were becoming interconnected, to say nothing of the revolutionary sentiment that was always on the verge of boiling over in Russia. So, in 1861, Tsar Alexander II bowed to the inevitable and emancipated the serfs. But it was more complicated than simply abolishing feudalism and making the former serfs free citizens of Russia, who could now own property or, even shockingly, marry who they chose without the permission of their landowners. Many serfs in Russia, even before emancipation, lived and worked here, on yeah. collective farms or state I'm back. Let's kill a plant monster.
is like a speed run. Come on, kill it. Kill it quick. Come on. Give me the speed run achievement. Nah, not quite. Oh, another... Another bucket. I like buckets. owned farms rather than for private landowners. Emancipation didn't have much of an effect on those relationships. As a result, the emancipation of the serfs was incomplete and you could argue was botched. After 1861, most of Russia's best farmland was still owned by nobles or by the state and armies of poor peasants still tilled the soil and lived on the brink of starvation and the economic development of Russia as a modern economy was still extremely slow. Revolutionaries of every conceivable ideological stripe had been trying to overthrow the Russian monarchy for a century before it actually happened. Revolutionary groups and societies were everywhere. One of these groups actually managed to blow up Alexander II with a bomb they threw at his carriage in 1881 a particularly gruesome assassination. The subsequent Romanov monarchs became even more allergic to any hint of political reform, and they sent legions of secret police, called the Okhrana, fanning out through Russia to arrest, harass, and kill suspected revolutionaries. In 1887, on the sixth anniversary of the assassination of Alexander II, another group, called the Narodnaya Volya, the People's Will, try to repeat performance by chucking bombs at the new czar, Alexander III. This attempt failed, and several of the conspirators were arrested and hanged. One of them was 21-year-old Alexander Yulianov. His younger brother, Vladimir, was deeply affected by his brother's death and decided to avenge him by going into revolutionary politics himself. We'll see a lot more of Vladimir Yulianov, also known as Lenin, in future chapters. Alexander III croaked in 1894. His successor was his son, Nicholas, age 26, who had just gotten engaged to a German princess, Alix of Hesse Darmstadt. Tsar Nicholas II was officially coronated more than a year later in May 1896. A huge celebration attended by over 100,000 people was held on a large field outside Moscow called Kodinka. Midway through the festivities, a rumor got started that the free beer that was available at more than 20 pop-up pubs on the enormous field was about to run out. A stampede resulted, with people trampled, crushed, and suffocated. The official death toll of the Kodnika tragedy was clocked at 1,389, but it might have been much higher. Nicholas and Alexandra, the new Tsar and Tsarina, refused even to make a public statement. In Russian superstition, this was thought to be a very bad omen for the coming reign of the new Tsar. Not a good look for the Russian royal family, who was on thinner ice than they realized. Up until now, I've been treating our various monarchies, the big dynastic families, and the countries they ruled as separate entities. At least with regard to three of them, that characterization is a bit misleading. For purposes of this chapter, set aside the Ottomans and the Chinese Eisengioro family. Clearly, they were not related to the others. But as for the remaining three, Habsburgs, Hohenzollerns, and Romanovs, and England's royal family, the House of Hanover, in some ways, it's more accurate to think of them as one family, because a lot of them were related. This could be a deep dive all its own, but I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible, which is no small feat. In my opinion, family trees don't present well on screen, so I'm going to try to avoid that too. If I didn't, the family tree would resemble an organizational chart of the Amway Tools cult. It's so hellaciously complicated. England's royal family was mostly German. In 1714, Queen Anne of Great Britain, the last of the Stuarts, died without surviving kids. 
Her second cousin, George, who had been born in Hanover, then in the Holy Roman Empire, became king under British law. Five more members of this mostly German family reigned as monarchs of Britain from the 18th to the early 20th centuries. Of the six Hanover kings and queens, all of them married Germans. Now this family intertwining started long before Queen Victoria, but just for simplicity's sake, let's focus on her. She was born in 1819, the daughter of a son of King George III and his wife, who was, you guessed it, German. She was from Saxe Coburg Saalfeld. Victoria, age 18, then unmarried, became Queen of England in May 1837, when her uncle, King William IV, croaked. Victoria was already related to the Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns. She was a direct descendant through daughters of Ferdinand I, a Habsburg, and Holy Roman Emperor from 1556 to 1564. Ferdinand I's granddaughter, Mara Eleonora of Cleves, married the Duke of Prussia, Albert Frederick, a Hohenzollern, in 1573. My God, just look at that collar. Their daughter, Magdalena Sibylla of Prussia, was great-great-great-grandmother to Catherine the Great, which makes Victoria related to the Romanovs as well. After several more generations of daughters, we eventually get down to Marie of Saxe coburg Queen Victoria's mother. In 1840, Victoria married her first cousin, Albert of Saxe coburg being a Saxe Coburg, he was also related to various Habsburgs, Hohenzollerns, and Romanovs. Victoria had nine children. Her first daughter, also named Victoria, married Frederick III, the King of Prussia and future Emperor of Germany, in 1858. Their son was Wilhelm II, Kaiser of the German Empire, and a major character in this story. Queen Victoria's second daughter, Princess Alice, married Louis IV, the Grand Duke of Hesse in 1862. One of her daughters was Princess Alix of Hesse, who later became Tsarina Alexandra when she married Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia. Are you confused yet? Just for good measure, Queen Victoria's children were also parents of members of the royal families of Greece, Sweden, Norway, Romania, and Spain. And of course, Great Britain, as Victoria's son would be King Edward VII, and her grandson, King George V. For cultural reasons, it would never have happened, obviously, but one wonders about an alternate history reality where Queen Victoria's youngest daughter, Beatrice, instead of marrying Prince Henry of Battenberg, had instead been married off to Ai Xinjioro Zaichun, the Tongxi Emperor of China. They were roughly the same age. Or if Victoria's third daughter, Princess Helena, instead of marrying Prince Christian of Schleswig-Holstein, had somehow found herself betrothed to Mehmed V, the second to last Ottoman Sultan. They were also roughly the same age. Now that would have been something. So with all of these European royals being related and often marrying relations, particularly cousins as Victoria did, you might be thinking about the obvious issue, inbreeding. Genetic diseases often arise in families where there's a lot of marriage between cousins, and that's certainly true here. In the case of this family, one of the major genetic conditions that got passed on was hemophilia. Queen Victoria was a carrier of the gene that causes this condition. In case you didn't know, hemophilia is a condition where blood doesn't clot. A person afflicted with it could theoretically bleed to death from a paper cut or more commonly and painfully from unchecked internal bleeding that could be caused, for example, by a minor bruise. Today, this condition can be treated with modern drugs and is much less serious now than it was 100 years ago. But at the beginning of the 20th century, hemophilia was an extremely dangerous and agonizing affliction. Victoria passed on hemophilia to at least three of her great-grandsons, one of whom was Alexis, the Tsarevich of Russia, the son of Tsar Nicholas II and Victoria's granddaughter, Alix of Hesse-Darmstadt. The condition becomes historically important in this case, so hold that thought. It becomes important later. Victoria died in January 1901, having lived into the 20th century just under the wire. Her son Bertie had been waiting decades to take the throne, 
kind of like somebody else we know. But at age 59, he finally became King Edward VII. A fun-loving man who lived as large as he was physically, Edward, Bertie, smoked and drank prodigiously and had a reputation as a reckless playboy. He was king for less than 10 years. On May 6, 1910, a heart attack took him out. Nonetheless, his name has been given to the whole era that he lived in, the Edwardian era, which colloquially refers to that post-Victorian twilight just before the outbreak of World War I. With the accession of Bertie's son, King George V, in 1910, the thrones of three major European powers, Britain, Germany, and Russia, were all in the hands of members of the same family. Congratulations on Taco. Kaiser Wilhelm Kuckles. II of Germany and Nicholas II of Russia famously sent each other notes and telegrams signed Nicky and Willie. Often they were in English. George V was not really a policy maker in the same way that his cousins were, but the family resemblance is very striking, as you can see. Did family relationships have to do with the political and military rivalries of the pre-World War I era? It's possible. Germany and Britain were engaged in a ferocious arms race, especially when it came to naval armaments, capital ships. When Britain introduced the HMS Dreadnought, the most advanced battleship in the world, in 1906, Kaiser Wilhelm demanded that Germany catch up. Wilhelm was quite insecure. Historians often blame his thin skin and toxic masculine insecurity on his deformed left arm, which was caused by an injury at birth by the doctor who delivered him. In adulthood, he became Kaiser of Germany in 1888. He tended to wear ridiculously over-the-top military uniforms in public and often held a pair of gloves in his left hand to de-emphasize that his left arm was considerably shorter than his right. Would it be a low blow to suggest that there could have been another abnormally short part of Wilhelm's anatomy that he might have been compensating for? I'm sure I'll get grumbling in the comments for even mentioning it, but come on, admit it, you were thinking it too. The take home point here is that the monarchies, at least the European ones, were closely related. Family dynamics and even the psychology that arises from family relationships certainly played a role in the coming of World War I and the changes that eventually swept the monarchies away. We need to keep this in mind as we move forward. Now, after a lot of context, we finally get to the first of the revolutions of the early 20th century. As you'll see, it was incomplete, but still incredibly momentous. At the turn of the 20th century, Russia was a huge mess. The country's economy was still overwhelmingly agrarian, its people overwhelmingly rural, and most of them poor. That whole thing with the emancipation of the serfs had not worked out too well. The regime of Nicholas II paid lip service to trying to modernize and industrialize, and there were some gains, like the completion of the Trans-Siberian Railway, though even that was financed mostly by foreign money, especially French. There was basically a tiny, paper-thin crust of industrial activity on the top of a deep well of an old country that wasn't really much different than it had been in the late 16th century. Russia was completely riddled with anti-Semitism. Riots and massacres against Jews, the famous pogroms, broke out with regularity in the late 19th century, some encouraged by the government and the secret police, the Okhrana. And since the assassination of the Tsar in 1881, despite frequent crackdowns by the Okhrana, the revolutionary underground in Russia had grown stronger, not weaker. In 1904, the same year that Tsar Nicholas and his wife were, after 10 years and four daughters, finally left the world son, who was afflicted with hemophilia, Russia blundered into an international situation that made everything worse. Japan had been expanding militarily in Asia for years, fighting a war with China in 1894 and increasing its influence in Manchuria. They also had designs on Korea, which they would shortly take. Russia, having just completed its railway link from Moscow and St. Petersburg to the Far East, was angling for that age-old Russian strategic dream, a warm water port. Vladivostok, whose harbor was a block of ice half the year, just wouldn't do. The best option for them was to steal a port from the Chinese, who were too weak to stop them. Russia pressured China into leasing it in 1898, the port of Lushun, 
uh, then known as Port Arthur. This led to some furrowed eyebrows among the Japanese, but the feeling was definitely mutual. Nicholas II needed no prodding to be racist, but his cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm II, had been stinking up his inbox for years with letters warning him about the so-called yellow peril of the Japanese. Wilhelm was obsessed with the whole yellow peril stuff. After negotiations over shared Russian and Japanese spheres of influence in Northeast Asia broke down, Japan's government decided on war. On February 9, 1904, a Japanese armada surprise attack. What's my next Slayer task gonna be? And only a few hours later, after hostilities um. were already on, did Japan deliver its declaration of war, quite similar to a tactic they would use against the Forced, United States uh, in 1941. Demons. Sorry, it's the no war longer banned. Can't ban it. Well no, Russia. it's banned. Strategically, the odds favored it's Japanese bad, my friend. They had much shorter Take distances to it's move their troops and ships, whereas the Russian Far East was connected to European Russia through only we the tiny, the tenuous nope. thread of sometimes a single rail line, and it took literally months for Russia's Atlantic fleet to sail around the world to take part in fighting in northeastern Asia. The Japanese put Port Arthur under siege and advanced rapidly in Manchuria. For racist reasons, Nicholas simply couldn't believe that a nation governed by white people was losing to an Asian power. Shortages and economic effects of the war pinched the Russian home front, especially in the cities. There were occasional strikes and walkouts in what few factories Russia had in Moscow and St. Petersburg. The Tsar was pretty oblivious to it all. A devoted family man, in 1904 and 1905, he and his wife Alexandra were desperate to find a treatment for their baby son's bleeding episodes. That would lead to Rasputin, but we're not quite there yet. On January 2nd, 1905, the Russian commander of Port Arthur surrendered to the Japanese after a nine-month siege and after the remainder of Russia's fleet had been destroyed. Right, let's see. Shock and discontent Kill 200 trolls. in St. Petersburg. Another strike uh, in a steel mill gonna... spread into a wave of labor unrest many cannonballs that crippled the embryonic industrial sector of Russia's economy. Please, please hold. Major labor and political demonstrations demanding reform from the Tsar were scheduled for January 22nd, January 9th on the old Julian calendar that the Russians were still using. Enter Father Yuri yeah, Gapon, a Russian Orthodox priest. Now this guy is quite an enigma in history. He was an agent of the Okhrana, but he seems to have had considerable and genuine sympathy with Russia's urban poor. And he may have acted on his own when he started to organize coordination between the labor groups in the run up to Blue the Dragons. January 22nd demonstration. Gapon drafted a petition with various reform demands that he, leading the crowd, intended to present to the Tsar during a mass march on the hells? You guys are not Gapon giving me some good weren't told tasks. that the Tsar wasn't even there. He and his family had gone to their palace at Sarskoy Selo about 16 years ago. Fire giants! There were then, and still are, rumors that the Okhrana organized and encouraged the march so that the government would have an excuse to teach the people a lesson by crushing the demonstration. More than a hundred years later, okay, you know it's what? I'm impossible gonna to unblock worms this and block true. fire giants. It's I not think. entirely sure how many people attended the march. Estimates range from a low of 3,000 Kill 110 high, drakes. 80, okay, that's fine. Tsarist troops fired on the crowd. Never killed a drake Not before, in one single but... incident, but in several simultaneous altercations. Just as we don't know... There's no time like the present to kill drakes. All right, what do what do we, what do I do against streaks here? They uh, what do they do?
Why is it saying I should cannon them? I can't cannon them. Surely not. Grab me holy wrench. Oh wait, I have to use, don't I have to use my boots? Those dumb boots, boots of, boots of stony. Oof, negative range bonus. That kind of sucks. Oh well. I don't know if I actually need that, but... Let's go try killing some drakes, I guess. That's worms. Drakes, okay. It's a cute little lizard. All right, so I chugged this this and I pre-ranged I think Hoping a, to get a Drake's tooth. That's what we. That's what we want. Oh, how many people were there? It's hard to gauge the death toll for sure, but the massacre came to be known as Bloody Sunday throughout Russia. Incidentally, there are no known photographs of the Bloody Sunday Massacre, but at least in the West, still images of a recreation of the event, which was done for a Soviet-made silent film in 1925, were passed Dude, off that, that, that as that genuine. Is I intense. remember seeing them in a history book and identified as real when I was in high school. The massacre threw gasoline on the smoldering unrest in Russia in 1905. Strikes and demonstrations sprang up everywhere. Revolutionary groups started to organize councils known as Soviets, which issued endless demands on the government. The most frequently heard called for a constitution and a legislature, or at least a proto-legislature, which was eventually called the Duma. 
In an incident made famous by the 1925 Sergei Eisenstein film, the crew of the Russian battleship Potemkin mutinied against their officers and joined revolutionary councils in Odessa. Though the famous Odessa Steps Massacre sequence depicted in that film did not occur in real life. Predictably, the revolutionary unrest gave the anti-Semites yet another excuse to riot, and a fresh wave of anti-Jewish massacres, the worst so far up to that point, swept through the country in the months following the uprisings. Now, there's no need to go through all the ins and outs of the 1905 revolution more than I already have. Suffice it to say, after first insisting that he would grant no reforms at all, Nicholas did what he did best, which was to buckle under the belt. In October, he issued a manifesto granting a provisional Duma to the legislature, and he started the process of drafting a constitution, which went into effect in 1906. It didn't give the Duma very much power, but as autocratic as Russia was, any step toward democracy was a big one. Aside from doting on their family, the chief obsession of Nicholas and Alexander, who worked as a team in many respects, was to ensure that autocratic power of the Russian czars devolved absolutely intact to their son, Alexis. Even when he was in his teens, which he barely made it, Alexis's parents still called him baby, and their letters to each other, which survived the war and the revolution, constantly referenced baby's power or preserving baby's freedom of action. In 1905, Alexis literally was a baby, usually a very sick one, sometimes on the brink of death. So wait, do they not, um... Well, I guess they do also melee. Seems like if you melee them, you need a lot of food, though. Yeah. But his parents saw it as their duty to resist to the furthest extremity possible any political reform that would in any way constrain the powers of Nicholas's successor. In 1905, they failed at this grand ambition. Nicholas believed the choice was between granting some tiny little semblance of political reform or having his entire regime swept away in an out of control revolution. Given that choice, he chose the former, but he regretted it for the rest of his days. Ultimately, the Tsar and his government did tamp down the revolution just barely enough to avoid being blasted out of power. After the revolution, though, there was a sense that the monarchical power of the Romanov dynasty was hanging by a thread. The next crisis, the next war, might push it over the edge and cut the thread. As for the war with Japan, Nicholas had to put that fire out as soon as possible. In May 1905, he accepted the standing offer of the U.S. President, Theodore Roosevelt, to mediate. Sergei Vita, who had been involved in the intrigues of Father Tatan and who would shortly become the first Prime Minister of Imperial Russia, was sent to the U.S. to negotiate with the Japanese and with Teddy Roosevelt. At a lunch that occurred at Roosevelt's Oyster Bay, New York estate, Sagamore Hill, during the negotiations, Vita was horrified that they ate on a wooden table with no tablecloth and the president served ice water instead of wine. Americans have no culinary taste, he said, and they can eat almost anything. Still, despite his dislike of both TR and the Japanese delegate, Kimura, Vita reached a peace treaty that spared Russia the bad press of an even more thoroughly humiliating defeat. For his role in negotiating the Treaty of Portsmouth, Roosevelt received the Nobel Peace Prize, the first U.S. president ever to win one. Similar to Russia's plight, the Ottoman Empire spent most of the 19th century trying desperately to shut out modernity, then belatedly and somewhat half-heartedly embracing it when they realized the rest of the world had passed them by. The decay of the Ottoman Empire is a very long story. Secret societies dedicated to pushing the empire toward modernization sprang up, especially among university-educated men and within the military. One of these societies became a group known as the Young Ottomans. In the 1870s, a ridiculously complicated series of wars began involving the Ottoman Empire and its neighbors in the Balkans, including Serbia. And there was also a series of revolts, 
Bosnia and Herzegovina, for instance, and also in Bulgaria. In the case of Bulgaria, the Ottoman government brutally crushed the revolt, killing over 30,000 people. European powers were outraged and convened a conference in Istanbul to discuss how to quote unquote protect Christian minorities in the empire, and also how to block Russia's ambitions for, you guessed it, a warm water port. During this Mishigas, in 1876, the young Ottomans instituted a palace coup, which brought Abdul Hamid, then aged 34, to the throne. In December of that same year, the new Sultan, Abdul Hamid, proclaimed a new constitution, which provided for free elections and a legislature. In 1877, another war broke out. This one between Russia and the Ottoman Empire, Russia was cruising for revenge for the Crimean War. The Ottomans were predictably defeated in this war, utterly clowned in fact. The result was the establishment by a series of treaties of various newly independent countries in the Balkans, such as Romania, and formal recognition of others that had been independent in practice for a long time, like Serbia, but still technically attached to the empire. Also, the province of Bosnia and Herzegovina, one province despite the name that makes it sound like two, that was given to Austria-Hungary to administer and occupy. Also, oh, you want some? So they you want some Drake lores? Are you seeing these guys? Is my stream open? I am. I am seeing them. They are dragons who are genetically bred to be war machines and also have gaping sores instead of wings. That's the things on their back. It's like to be a Drake. Despite their creation being a cruel joke, I'm gonna murder them because the guy told me to. I mean, that checks out. They're very bad, they're bad individuals! That guy's gonna melee me. Oh, no he's not. That guy's gonna melee me. He's not gonna melee me, he's gonna... He's gonna come. Sure, the man who told you this is an upstanding individual who, uh, like, listen if he told you to jump off a bridge and stuff. Yeah, of course. He lives in the middle of the jungle. I always listen to anyone who lives in the middle of the jungle. Hmm. They did not formally annex it for another 30 years. War was an excuse for ethnic cleansing and various genocides and attempted genocides both within the Ottoman Empire and in the newly independent or newly recognized areas. The late 1870s was not a good time to be a Circassian, an Armenian Christian, or a Bulgarian Muslim. This kind of thing is going to keep happening, unfortunately, all throughout this period. The Ottomans' defeat in the war was also an excuse for Sultan Abdul Hamid to suspend the constitution, which was only two years old. Getting the constitution back online became a goal of the young Ottomans and their various successor groups, which included a cabal, mostly of medical students and Ottoman army officers, called the Young Turks. There were factions within the Young Turks, the most important being the Committee of Union and Progress, which became a political party. One of the members of this party was an army officer named Mustafa Kemal, who will play an important role later in our story. In June 1908, Britain's King Edward VII met with Tsar Nicholas II of Russia at Tallinn, Estonia, which was then known as Raval, for a yachting party. As a result of this friendly meeting between monarchs, Britain and Russia came to a rapport with each other after decades of rivalry in the Balkans and the Black Sea area. Now this could prove disastrous to Turkey's foreign policy, which depended on playing the British and Russians off one another. So the Young Turks decided it was time to strike and to save the Ottoman Empire from further decay. In July, an Ottoman army group in the province of Macedonia, under the command of one of the Young Turks, mutinied against Sultan Abdul Hamid, and when the Sultan sent another army group to arrest them, they joined the mutineers. The Committee of Union and Progress sent an ultimatum to the Sultan on July 23rd. Reinstate the Constitution of 1876 or be deposed. Seeing the writing on the wall, Abdul Hamid buckled. He agreed to their demands. 
The Young Turk Revolution of July 1908 was basically a palace coup. There was no popular revolution. There were not very many crowds in the streets carrying red banners or shutting factories down, at least not on the front end of this. And the Young Turks notably did not take power themselves. They were content, at least at first, to pressure the Sultan into doing their bidding. And for a time, it seemed to work. There were elections that the Constitution had promised. The Parliament reconvened in December 1908. Abdul Hamid was even there, giving a speech that played well to the newspapers with praising of liberal democracy. Conservative Muslims in the Ottoman Empire, though, really didn't like the Young Turk Revolution. On April 6, 1909, an Istanbul journalist who had written a bunch of articles criticizing the Young Turks and their program of liberalization and modernization was walking across this bridge, the Galata Bridge, when somebody shot him. Murder was never solved, but everyone assumed that the Committee of Union and Progress had done it demonstrations sprang up in Istanbul. When the unrest spread to military barracks, the government found itself in crisis. Demonstrators called for the disbanding of the Committee of Union and Progress, the reinstatement of Islamic Sharia law. During the month of April, the capital was in chaos. The Young Turks counterattacked. They sent an army from Thessalonica in Greece to Istanbul to crush the revolt. Mustafa Kemal, then a junior officer, was on the staff of one of this army's commanders. There was heavy fighting in parts of Istanbul between the Young Turks army, called the Action Army, and the soldiers who had joined the demonstrations. Eventually, the Action Army got the capital under control. They hanged some of the ringleaders publicly in the streets. The Committee of Union and Progress, which had briefly gone underground, reasserted itself. Most importantly, they deposed the Sultan. And because he was technically the caliph, the leader of Islam, the Young Turks had to get a prominent Muslim cleric to sign an order, a fatwa, legitimizing this move in theological terms. Abdul Hamid was uh, succeeded by his brother, Mehmed V, who was basically just a figurehead. Real power was now in the hands of the Central Committee, the Committee of Union and Progress. Their rule was disastrous. They wanted to modernize only to find that Western powers owned much of the country, such as the railroads. And the Ottoman Empire owed vast sums of money to European banks. The Young Turks seemed oblivious to the fact that their empire contained just as many ethnic and religious minorities as there were in Austria-Hungary. Yet, driven by the fevers of Turkish nationalism, the government mandated pro-Turkish teaching of history, languages, even alphabets used throughout the empire. Revolts inevitably sprung up, especially in Albania. The Committee of Union and Progress also cheated and spoiled elections in their favor. Most disastrous was the mismanagement of the wars that the Ottoman Empire found itself embroiled in beginning in 1911. Now I'm not going to go into detail on these wars because it would take another separate six-hour video to do them justice. Suffice it to say, there was a war with Italy, which had decided to take over Libya, ostensibly an Ottoman province. Then there were two Balkan wars, one in 1912, then a second a year later in which Balkan countries, most of them recently freed from Ottoman rule, ganged up on the old empire to try to tear off what little pieces of it remained in Europe. Now, the Young Turks did not provoke these wars directly, but they did mismanage them. And the result was that on the eve of World War I, the Ottoman Empire had almost no territory left in Europe and very little influence left. They were economically weakened. Ethnic groups inside their borders were constantly on the verge of revolt or were revolting, and the Ottomans were in even worse shape than they were in before 1908. Although a pretty much unmitigated disaster, the Young Turk Revolution was not the disaster. end of the Ottoman Empire. That would come later. But it was a major step toward it, and the Young Turks would make two more disastrous decisions before they were done. Their decision to support Germany in World War I, and another, even more horrific genocide against the Armenians in 1915. We'll return to the final end of the Osmanli dynasty in chapter 18. One more thing, the Young Turk Revolution had a very direct impact on the beginning of World War I. 
It caused Austria-Hungary to do something, which put a ticking time bomb in place that eventually blew up during the July crisis of 1914. I'll talk about that in Chapter 10. If you think Russia was a mess in this period, imagine China saying, hold my beer. China's descent into chaos began in the early 19th century, but accelerated greatly as the century wore on. I mentioned the Opium Wars and the Taiping Rebellion back in Chapter 3. That was just the tip of the iceberg. During virtually the entire 19th century, China was a seething cauldron of death, war, starvation, chaos, and environmental catastrophe. As I also mentioned earlier, since 1861, China had effectively been a dictatorship controlled by Cixi, known as the Dowager Empress, who originally came to the Qing court as a courtesan and then skillfully insinuated herself into power. Cixi excelled at palace intrigue, but she was pretty much a failure at all other aspects of statecraft. As her time in power continued, foreign countries, especially Britain, Germany, and Japan, controlled larger and larger pieces of China, from banks and railroads to actual provinces, ports, and territories. In the 1890s, yet another uprising got going, this one called the Yihe Tuan. One of the various names of this group translates to Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists. And this, plus the group's emphasis on traditional martial arts, caused Westerners to refer to them colloquially as the boxers. Long story short, the Yihe Tuan blamed China's problems on foreigners and especially had it out for Christian missionaries, which they run around killing in large numbers. In the summer of 1900, the Yihe Tuan surrounded and tried to storm the enclave in Beijing, where foreign powers active in China had their legations and headquarters. Seeing which way the wind was blowing, Cixi eventually sided with the rebels, a multinational coalition of troops from various Western countries plus Japan fought their way to Beijing and ended the siege. Then they stuck Cixi with a huge bill for reparations and a laundry list of new demands, more foreign humiliation of China. During this period, there were almost as many revolutionary groups in China as there were in Russia, and like them, they had a broad rainbow of ideologies. A prominent revolutionary called Sun Yat-sen organized a number of these groups into a front called the United League, or Tong Men Hui, in 1905. This was the forerunner of the Guomintang, also known as the KMT, or the Nationalist. Chinese history in this period gets real complicated real fast. Cixi, as the power behind the throne, ruled only so long as the emperors, the Tongxi Emperor, her son, and the Guangzhou Emperor, her nephew, were alive and able to be controlled. In fact, in 1898, she put her nephew, the Guangzhou Emperor, under house arrest when he tried to assert himself and enact badly needed reforms. She tried some reforms of her own, but it was too little too late and her heart wasn't in it anyway. In November 1908, when Cixi realized she was dying, she had her nephew, the emperor, poisoned with arsenic. He died on November 14, 1908. On literally her last day alive, Cixi chose his nephew, Pu Yi, a two-year-old baby, as the new emperor. His father, Prince Chun, would be the regent. Her death left China essentially leaderless in a moment of maximum weakness. By this time, there were revolts and rebellions against the Qing dynasty popping up everywhere all the time. It seemed very clear to many people in China that the dynasty had lost the mandate of heaven. And with all the revolutionaries running around, it was only a matter of time before the dynasty fell. While the double 10 revolution that brought it down was certainly not accidental, there is sort of an element of randomness to it in the sense that if it might have been any of the numerous rebellions that could have caught fire across the country and eventually brought down the government. The one that eventually did it is usually called the Wuxiang Uprising, and it had to do with railroads. Part of the big reparations bill that the Western powers stuck China with after the Yihe Tuan siege of Beijing hawked China's railroads to Western banks. 
In 1911, the Qing government under Prince Chun, as you remember the emperor's father, had just nationalized the railroads so that they could sell them off to foreign interests to pay off their debts. As a result, the Railway Rights Protection Movement sprang up. In the late summer of 1911, popular demonstrations by the Railway Protection Movement were everywhere, but especially in Hubei province. The government sent an army to quell the demonstrations. Revolutionary cells were quite active in planning various uprisings. On October 9, 1911, one revolutionary group was making bombs when one of them went off, severely injuring a revolutionary leader whose identity had previously been unknown to the authorities. When he went to the hospital, the authorities found out who he was. Revolutionary elements within the army, which had been sent, as you recall, to battle the railway rights protection movement, decided that they couldn't wait any longer to stage an uprising. The next day, they mutinied and captured the local garrison headquarters. The fact that it happened on October 10th, 1010, gives the event this name by which the, uh, some Chinese commemorate it, the Double Ten Revolution. Revolts, particularly in the Qing army, rippled outward from Hubei province. Ironically, Sun Yat-sen, who regarded himself as one of the leaders of the revolutionary underground, wasn't even in China at the time. He was in the United States, raising money from Chinese expats. It should be noted that Sun and several revolutionary groups in China had ties to far-right elements in Japan, which had re just recently taken over Korea. Japanese thought that revolution and chaos in China would inure to their benefit, which is why they supported these groups. I don't need to go into the whole blow-by-blow blow of how all the revolts sprang up and coalesced into a wave that swept the Qing dynasty out of power. But there are two important things about the Chinese Revolution of 1911. One is that it had a heavily ethnic character. Remember that the Manchus and the ruling Isenjioro family were a separate ethnic group from the majority of people in mainland China? Well, the revolts in the fall of 1911 often resulted in large-scale violence by Han Chinese against Manchus. During the uprising in Shaanxi province, in the city of Xi'an, mobs of Han people burned down the Manchu quarter of the city, killing over 10,000 of them. The revolution was framed as a return of China to rule by Han people and as an occasion for revenge against the Manchu oppressors who had dominated it since the 17th century. What if you were a Drake? The second I would important uh, thing about the Chinese sing rap music or something? Yeah. Hey, you're gonna say you would call me on your cell phone? Army, that would be a better reference. New army that the Qing had tried yeah, I wouldn't, to I wouldn't know that reference, I'm gonna be honest with you. Rather, I wouldn't know that was Drake. Once the Qing I top general, Yuan at first know. fought on the side of the dynasty against the revolutionaries. But then realizing that if he suppressed them, his usefulness would be diminished, he started negotiating with them. The revolutionary fronts had elected Sun Yat-sen, once he returned to China, president of the new provisional government. Sun had political clout, but Yuan had military power. Yuan reached a deal with Sun and his people. If he, Yuan, could get the Qing government to agree to the abdication of the emperor, they, the revolutionaries, would put Yuan in as president in Sun's place. Sun agreed to this big mistake, as it turned out. Yuan Shikai got the royals to agree to quit, basically by threatening them. If they gave up and abdicated, remember the emperor was just a toddler at this point, he'd let them live in the Forbidden City and carry on some semblance of their lavish lifestyle. Emperor Puyi's mother seems to have made the decision. On February 12, 1912, 
the family signed the Instrument of Abdication, drafted by Yuan Shikai, and the Aizen Jioro monarchy was suddenly and abruptly ended. Thousands of years of dynastic rule of China were over. The Republic of China was, however, still extremely chaotic and the new government very, very weak. We don't need to go into all that happened after that, except that a major misstep by the government was allowing the governors of the various provinces to command and maintain their own armies. This gave rise to the next chaotic era in China's revolutionary history, the Warlord Era, which stretched on through the 19-teens and 1920s. Yuan Shikai, who was clearly the top dog in 1912 and the most powerful warlord, got a bit of a swelled head. In 1915, he decided that the Republic had outlived its usefulness and that he would found a new dynasty with himself as emperor. He thought the people of China would generally support it because he was a Han Chinese and he spun it through that ethnic lens of Han coming back to rule China after 300 years of Manchu domination. The short-lived restoration of the monarchy didn't take, though, and in any event, Yuan died in 1916. So much for that. He never really held power as an emperor, though he pretended to be one. There was, believe it or not, another attempt at a restoration in 1917. This one by ex-Qing sympathizers and a warlord dissatisfied with the Republican government. The idea was to put Pu Yi, now age 11, back on the throne. That only lasted two weeks, though. So in our story, this, the fall of the Aizen Jioro rule in China, is the first complete and permanent end of a monarchy. The Romanovs were severely tested in 1905. The Young Turks had taken over the Ottoman government in 1908, but nominally left the Sultan in place. In China in 1912, though, a monarchical system ruling the world's most populous country was fully taken out of power. It was an omen that the other crowned heads of the major monarchies should have heeded. True to form, they didn't. Throughout this video, I've been talking mostly about political events. It's worth spending a little bit of time on the economic and cultural landscape of Europe and the world on the eve of World War One. To say that a lot of change had come in the previous. I can literally just sit here. few decades is a spectacular understatement. Industrialization had changed just about everything, not just economies and standards of living, but the way people lived and how they thought. Many more people were living in cities in 1914 than half a century earlier. In the early to mid 19th century, cities were death traps full of disease. By 1914, that had been ameliorated somewhat by infrastructure <coughs> and sanitation. London, Paris, Berlin, New York, and other dying. cities Stop were dying, still idiot. big and gross, Stop dying. were less deadly no, than they had been in 1850. But by 1914, there was a huge underclass of industrial workers, wage earners, 
who were shaping the societies that they lived in. Labor conflict was a huge factor, especially in the United States, which suffered waves of crippling railroad and industrial strikes in 1877 and again in 1894, and in Britain, where coal miners virtually brought the industrial economy to a standstill, especially during strikes in 1910 and 1912. In Germany, Bismarck, while he was still chancellor, Kaiser Wilhelm II can camp. These Drake's drop tables really weird. Or I'm getting really. They, they just are always dropping law roots. Just constant law roots. I don't get it. Uh, I guess it's okay. I guess it's a very common drop for them to drop roots. I don't get it. Just drop your. Drop your tooth? I need to use your tooth to make my boots? My booty boots? sought to blunt the power of the working class and dilute the appeal of socialist parties, which he was deathly afraid of, by instituting social welfare programs. Bismarck instituted state-sponsored accident insurance and old age pension programs. Bismarck also enacted a primitive form of socialized health care, not exactly universal health care as we know it today, but a step in that direction. <laughs> His whole point in doing at? this was to stop social <laughs> saying being... how entertaining it was with the the last seat in the item. With the puppet and the lady mm. in Germany. The status of women was undergoing a major change in this period. Political movements working toward the enfranchisement of women had long been a thing in most Western countries and in many non-Western countries in the 19th century. Major women's suffrage movements picked up significant steam in the U.S. and Britain in the first decade of the 20th century. I talked a bit about this in one of the chapters of my Meaning of the Titanic video. Some women's suffrage campaigns involved civil disobedience, and some went even farther than that. In Britain, a group called the Women's Social and Political Union actually engaged in a campaign of terrorist bombings to try to gain the vote. Obviously, this organization was an outlier, but it shows you just how prominent and contentious the issue was. In the U.S., a major women's march in 1913, the day before the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson, was a major step forward toward the passage of the 19th Amendment, the progress of which was interrupted by World War I. Most of the major powers that took part in World War I had various colonial possessions around the world. Indeed, imperialism is usually cited as one of the big factors that gave rise to the war. Imperialism was never uncontroversial, either in the places being colonized or in the home countries doing the colonizing. When the U.S. got into the imperialism game in a big way in the 1890s, snatching the Philippines from Spain, overthrowing the government of Hawaii to make it an American protectorate, there was plenty of pushback at home. Mark Twain, for example, was a prominent public critic of imperialist policies. As colonizers went, Belgium was especially egregious. Leopold II, King of Belgium, had snatched a huge chunk of Central Africa as his own private property, not technically a colony, but his own personal real estate. A conference of major powers in Berlin in 1885, whose purpose was to carve up Africa among them as colonies, let him get away with it. 
Leopold exploited the Congo ruthlessly. Belgian troops forced the native peoples to produce ivory, especially rubber. Many thousands were tortured, mutilated, or killed when their villages couldn't meet their quotas. International criticism of the atrocities in the Congo pressured Leopold to give up his personal kingdom, which became an official Belgian colony in 1908, not necessarily a change for the better. Germany similarly exploited their colonies in eastern and southern Africa. There are numerous ethnic cleansings and mini genocides that occurred there in the years before World War I. France was squeezing resources out of Indochina, the Dutch out of East, the East Indies. Oil, which came from there, would become particularly important later. All of this came at a colossal human cost among the peoples who lived in these colonies. Britain, of course, held India, as well as a lot of other colonies around the world. The British government had taken direct control of India as colony from the British East India Company after a series of rebellions in 1857. Queen Victoria, in fact, was named the Empress of India in 1876. After the 1857 rebellions failed, various independence movements formed in India, most consequential of them the Indian National Congress, which was founded in 1885. The British routinely arrested and hanged Indian revolutionaries and independence leaders. By the eve of World War I, the Indian cities and countryside were rife with various movements and factions working to free India from British rule. Britain itself was going through a political crisis just before World War I. In 1909 and 1910, a constitutional crisis broke out over the power of the House of Lords to veto legislation involving government spending or taxation. This resulted in two contentious general elections in a row in the year 1910, and this became intertwined with another crisis in Parliament about granting political autonomy to Ireland. I talk about that in my Meaning of the Titanic video. In fact, the Irish Home Rule crisis was what the British government was preoccupied with at exactly the time that the chain reaction was beginning in July 1914 that led to the outbreak of war. I don't have time to follow up on any of these threads, any one of which could be the subject of its own deep dive video. My point in mentioning them is to hammer home exactly how chaotic the world was in the years immediately preceding World War I and how much change had occurred in only a short period of time before it. If you look at everything that was going on in this time, it's hard not to see the bigger picture as sort of a volcanic pressure building up in the institutions of the world and the war itself as the eruption. There are some odd cultural clues that a violent reckoning was coming. Just to mention one, again, my Meaning of the Titanic video deals with this subject in more depth. In Berlin in 1912, an expressionist painter named Ludwig Meidner began creating a series of bizarre apocalyptic pictures depicting cities on fire and landscapes ravaged by war with heaps of human bodies everywhere. Meidner claimed that he made these paintings in a weird trance-like state. Was he channeling something in the world's collective unconscious, if there is such a thing, that foreshadowed the war? I can't prove it. It's not the type of thing that you can prove. But the apocalyptic landscapes of Ludwig Meidner are an eerie prelude to the violence and destruction of the war itself. It's worth thinking about. So here we are again, the infamous street corner in Sarajevo where Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. Before we get to all that, and even before I explain who Franz was and what he was doing there, which I promised in chapter one that I would do, there's something else vitally important to this that we have to talk about first. Do you remember a couple of chapters ago when the Young Turks took over the government of the Ottoman Empire? That was in July 1908. It was triggered by a meeting between King Edward VII of Britain and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia in Tallinn, Estonia. Well, after the Young Turk takeover, some of the European powers were afraid that the new Turkish government would try to get back some of the various provinces that had been torn off of the Ottoman Empire in the past few decades. Specifically, Austria-Hungary was afraid that the Ottomans would try to get back the province of Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
which Austria had been occupying with its troops since 1878. The way to forestall this, thought the Austrian foreign minister, Count Alois Lexa von Ehrenthal, was for Austria-Hungary to formally annex this province. This is where Sarajevo is located, in case you forgot. The problem with that, annexing the province, was that Russia would probably object. Russia saw itself as sort of the big brother of the various Slavic peoples of Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Russia liked the idea of a pan-Slavic country, a Yugoslavia, that would be under its wing. To get around that problem, von Ehrenthal, his successor as foreign minister, and the Russian foreign minister hatched a nifty scheme. It went like this. Russia would demand that the Ottomans open the straits around Istanbul to Russian warships. Previously, Russian military vessels had been banned by a treaty signed by all the major powers from going through those straits, which was Russia's only way out of the Black Sea. Austria-Hungary would then tell the other European powers that it supported this demand, and with that support it would probably be granted. In exchange for this, Russia wouldn't do anything to stop or protest Austria-Hungary from annexing Bosnia and Herzegovina. These arrangements, however, were technically in violation of various treaties that both Austria-Hungary and Russia had signed. So if they were going to get away with it, the Austrian and Russian foreign ministers figured they would have to announce publicly both halves of the deal at once, thus daring the other powers to act against both of them. Now, I should mention that the Russian foreign minister who agreed to this scheme, Ivolsky, had not run it by Tsar Nicholas ahead of time. Ivolsky told von Ehrenthal that he needed some time before the deal was publicly announced so that he could bring his superiors on board. The problem was, though, that the Austrians jumped the gun. On October 6th, 1908, Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph announced that he was formally annexing Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Russians were outraged. Not only had they been duped, but they were shown up as having sold out their Slavic brothers who lived in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There was talk of war. Serbia even mobilized its army. Germany intervened and hinted that if Russia did not agree to uh, recognize the Austrian annexation of this province, that Germany would back Austria-Hungary in the event of war. Fearing that, Russia backed down. In March 1909, the Tsar reluctantly agreed he never got the promised quid pro quo, the opening of the straits, to his warships. I showed this photo in Chapter 1, and it also appears in the video about the sandwich myth associated with Gavrilo Princip. Eerie coincidence. This photo of Schiller's delicatessen in Sarajevo, on the corner where Princip would eventually assassinate the Archduke, was taken in October 1908. These people are reading a poster put up on the wall announcing Austria's annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, let's get back to the assassination. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, age 50, was the nephew of Austro-Hungarian Emperor Franz Joseph. Franz Joseph had a son, Rudolf, but he committed suicide in 1889 when the royal family wouldn't let him divorce his wife and marry his 17-year-old girlfriend. The girlfriend offed herself too at the same time, that left Franz Ferdinand the likely heir. Now, Franz Ferdinand was thought to be a little less conservative and unyielding than his uncle. It was expected that when he took the throne, which wouldn't be too far off, Franz Joseph was 83 at the time of the assassination, that Franz Ferdinand would enact some reforms and give the Slavic peoples in the empire some more of, though not all, of the autonomy that they wanted. It wouldn't be Yugoslavia, but it would be better than it was. That was what the Bosnian Serb plotters wanted to prevent, and the Bosnian Muslim plotters. The worse and more iron-fisted Austria's rule of the Slavic peoples in its empire was, the more those people would be motivated, it was thought, to revolt against them and to uh, help found a Yugoslavia by force. The plotters also thought that an act of terrorism would throw Austria-Hungary into chaos. Hence, the plotters decided to terminate Franz Ferdinand with extreme prejudice. 
The whole reason why Franz Ferdinand was even in Sarajevo that day was indirectly because of his wife. Sophie Schotek, born in what's now the Czech Republic, was a lady-in-waiting to one of the Habsburg archduchesses. Franz Ferdinand fell in love with her and they got married in 1900. Because she was a commoner though, there were elaborate rules at the Habsburg court about what she could and couldn't do. She often had to stand at the back of processions and such, and because she wasn't a royal, the children that they had were not in line for the throne. Now these rules infuriated Franz Ferdinand. The one area where they did not apply though was military functions. The emperor, Franz Joseph, planned to send his nephew to Bosnia to preside over military maneuvers designed to impress upon the Bosnians yet again that the empire ruled them. Franz Ferdinand took Sophie with him because, it being a military trip, this was one of the few functions that he could go to where she could actually accompany him. To add another layer of meaning to this visit, June 28, 1914, was the day of Ferdinand and Sophie's 14th wedding anniversary. And also, it was the anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo, which occurred in 1389, a key event in the nationalist history of Serbia. I don't need to rehash the circumstances of the assassination. This is where you all came in. I detailed the event itself in chapter one of this video. I keep returning to this street corner because it's amazing how little it's changed. The murder shocked Europe. The Austro-Hungarians assumed that the plot was hatched in Belgrade, the capital of Serbia, a country that had been deliberately stirring up trouble among the Slavic peoples inside Austria-Hungary. The Austro-Hungarian government decided immediately that it was going to crush Serbia, once and for all, militarily. But they couldn't just rush to war. That would irritate the powers. So they decided on a somewhat duplicitous plan involving an ultimatum to the Serbian government. Exactly how that ultimatum led to the outbreak of World War I is a very complicated story. It's like kind of like a Rube Goldberg machine, with so many moving parts, one affecting the other down the line. How it unfolded is generally called the July Crisis, because there are so many details in that story to discuss. I decided to break out that explanation into a separate companion video to this one. Now you all can do what you want, obviously. You can pause this video here and go watch that one or watch it later. Or if you think you know the July Crisis, skip it altogether, whatever strikes your fancy. But just know that when I pick up in a minute with chapter 11 of this video, the war will be on and the two major sides, the allies and the central powers, I'm not going to go into how they got that way anymore in this video. If you do decide to watch the July crisis video, keep in mind what happened in 1908 when Austria-Hungary annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. Russia was humiliated, back down to Germany, and was seen as having sold out the Slavic peoples. If there was to be another challenge to a Slavic country, Russia was now strongly motivated to not back down a second time. That's critical to understanding the fuse of the assassination that blew up into World War I. The thing about World War I that's hard to communicate today is just how shocking it was to the collective psyche of the Western world. Nothing like it had ever happened before. Modern industrialized weapons had been applied to battlefields on much smaller scales and on a slightly larger scale during the American Civil War, but never before in Europe on the order of magnitude that they were first used in World War I. On the Western Front, the main battlefields of Belgium and France, where principally the French and German armies face off, the war was dynamic and fluid for about its first month or so. But after the French army stopped the German advance on Paris at the Battle of the Marne, the momentum stopped. The armies dug into a colossal series of trenches and earthworks, zigzagging all the way from the Belgian coast to the border of Switzerland. Most of the lines stayed where they were for the next four years. So much for those German hopes of capturing Paris early and then shifting their focus to the east. On the Eastern Front, at an early battle at Allenstein in East Prussia, now Poland, the Germans called this the Battle of Tannenberg, in this countryside right here, this battle resulted in a clowning of Russian forces so epic that the Russian commander, Samsonov, shot himself 
rather than have to face the Tsar with the bad news. In fact, the war went very badly for the Russians, who consistently suffered vastly greater casualties than any other of their allies. They just didn't have the industry, the railroads, or the infrastructure to compete with the Germans, who were much better at all three. Russian commanders were pretty lackluster too, and disease killed four times as many Russians as German or Austro-Hungarian bullets did. As the war broke out, of the four remaining monarchies, remember China has been taken off the board by this point, only the Ottoman Empire remained uncommitted. Ottoman foreign policy had long been a game of trying to play off one big power against another, but it was hard to know how to do that now when all the other major powers were fighting each other. The Ottomans officially declared neutrality. Said Halim, the Grand Vizier, the equivalent of the Prime Minister of Ottoman Turkey, reached out to Britain, Russia, and Germany in the early days of the war, it was pretty clear that the Ottoman Empire was a potential ally up for grabs by either side. It was Germany who made the successful grab for Ottoman support. Ultimately, Said Halim and the Young Turk government tilted toward Germany. There were complicated reasons for this. One of the main ones was that Russia, now on the side of the Allies, had long wanted access to Istanbul, Constantinople. And if the Allies won, the Ottomans thought that the British and French were likely to let Russia have it. So they were naturally opposed to the Ottomans' interests. Germany also skillfully played the Ottoman government, which bypassed its own supposedly semi-democratic procedures and just went ahead and decided to join Germany with the Central Powers. A disastrous decision, as it would turn out. The Ottoman Empire joined the war with a surprise naval attack on Russian ports on the Black Sea at the end of October 1914. There... Poor Brinny, dude. Being Still doesn't have his mask. No, check it's worse than that. He sounds he sounds serious. I would hope he's lying, but it sounds like it actually happened that way. It's awful. Rip. There were other fronts too. All the colonies of the warring powers were involved, often sending colonial subjects in tens or hundreds of thousands to the battlefields in Europe, some as laborers, some as soldiers. People from many African countries served in the French army. So did Vietnamese and many other Southeast Asians. Indians were conscripted into the British army in huge numbers. There was fighting in Africa itself, the Germans had colonies there, and in the Middle East, which I'll get to in a moment. But the decisive front was in the West, and for a long time there was no decisive battle in the offing. The trench stalemate was intractable. Both sides tried various tactics to break through it, such as poison gas, or eventually tanks, didn't really work. After the French army was drained in a monstrous Battle of Verdun, the British army stepped up with a huge offensive on the River Somme in 1916. It produced a mountain of corpses, but nothing that could tip the war in the favor of one side or the other. The Germans did have one weapon that the Allies didn't have, at least in significant numbers, the submarine. The British Navy blockaded the coast of Germany as soon as the war began and effectively bottled up the German surface fleet. But Britain depended on a seaborne lifeline to North America for much of what it needed to keep fighting, especially food and money. In the early days of the war, so many ships carrying gold bullion from New York crossed the Atlantic to Britain that Woodrow Wilson had to put a moratorium on the shipment of gold to prevent harmful economic effects. The Germans began using their subs, extremely primitive at that time, but effective, to target shipping headed for Britain. Citizens of neutral countries, particularly the United States, 
were sometimes killed in these attacks, but always in fairly small numbers, until May 1915, nine months into the war. The Cunard ocean liner Lusitania, the last jumbo passenger liner the British still had in civilian service, sailed for Southampton from New York on May 1st. A week later, as Lusitania was steaming off the coast of Ireland, almost at the end of her voyage, a German submarine got lucky. One torpedo shot caused coal dust in Lusitania's bunkers or munitions carried secretly in her hold. Some say it's disputed. Anyway, the torpedo caused something to explode and blow out the whole bottom of the ship. She sank in 18 minutes, killing nearly 1,200 people, including 128 American citizens. Americans were outraged. President Wilson's angry protests persuaded the German high command to suspend their policy of what they called unrestricted submarine warfare, targeting ships in war zones without prior warning. But they reserve the right to turn that back on at any time. Remember that becomes important later. For the time being, America stayed out, which was just as well. Wilson was running for re-election in 1916, and he barely squeaked out a narrow victory over his Republican opponent, Charles Hughes. The Young Turk government of the Ottoman Empire remaining true to their track record of making the biggest and most monstrous mistakes at every possible opportunity, launched a genocide against Armenian Christian minorities within the empire, whom they suspected, falsely in most cases, of being a subversive fifth column supporting Russia and the Allies. The Ottomans had conducted or tolerated large-scale massacres of Armenians in the 1890s and again in 1909, in the wake of the counter-coup against the Young Turks, but the 1915 massacres were on a much larger scale. About a million Armenians, possibly more, were rounded up by Turkish authorities and forcibly relocated to remote desert areas where they starved. Smaller numbers were executed outright, subjected to sexual violence, or forcibly converted to Islam. This was one of the most infamous genocides of the 20th century which gave considerable inspiration to Hitler 25 years later in his project to annihilate the Jews of Europe. The modern-day government of Turkey continues to deny this genocide even today. The British targeted the Ottoman Empire in a couple of ways. In 1915, they opened a second front against them on the peninsula of Gallipoli, aiming ultimately to, con to c gain control of the straits leading from the Mediterranean into the Black Sea. This operation was the brainchild of Winston Churchill and heavily utilized fresh troops from Australia and New Zealand. It didn't go so well. The Allies were forced to withdraw from Gallipoli in early 1916. Next, the British tried to stir up trouble within the Ottoman Empire itself, principally among the Arab tribes. British agents, including T.E. Lawrence, the famous Lawrence of Arabia, made inconsistent promises to various Arab nationalist leaders, which would create a huge mess after the war. The British also promised to support a Jewish homeland in Palestine, another inconsistent promise. The Arab Revolt of 1916, led by Prince Faisal, and in which Lawrence played a prominent prominent role did create havoc within the empire's Arabian provinces, but it did not, did not knock the Ottomans out of the war. Italy had been in a defensive alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war, but remained neutral in its early stages. In 1915, secret negotiations with the Allies, in which the Italians perceived that they had been promised certain territories belonging to Austria-Hungary when the war was over, anyway, this persuaded the Italians to join the Allied side. Much of the front between Italy and Austria-Hungary occurred in high mountains. Thanks to the retreat of glaciers induced by human-caused global warming, we're just now finding corpses from some of these battles all over the place at high altitudes. Like the Western Front, neither side could really press a decisive advantage against the other. Austria-Hungary was a mess during the war. The economy stalled, inflation spiraled out of control, and the daily quality of life for most people, even in Vienna, went down considerably. The Habsburgs seemed kind of asleep at the wheel. Franz Joseph, the very elderly emperor, was never seen in public and rarely heard from. He left most of the execution of the war to the military men who deferred to Germany on just about everything. 
In November 1916, Franz Joseph went for a walk in a park near Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna with the King of Bavaria, and he caught a slight chill. He flared into pneumonia. On November 21st, Emperor Franz Joseph died, age 84. He was succeeded by Karl I, age 29, the nephew of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, himself the nephew of Franz Joseph. Karl was destined to be the last Habsburg ruler. The monarchy would collapse on his watch just shy of two years later. This is about where things stood on the eve of the Russian Revolution. Or I should say revolutions, plural. You can argue that there were two, or at least a revolution followed several months later by a coup. Gee, I wonder what the difference is. Anyway, the Romanov dynasty was about to exit the stage of history. That's the story that we turn to next. Russia botched the First World War pretty badly. When it broke out in August 1914, Tsar Nicholas led the nation in a romantic fervor of patriotism and dedication to the holy cause of Mother Russia. But neither the military he had nor the commanders who worked for him could fulfill the promises of victory that he was still in them. Between 1914 and 1917, one Russian military offensive after another ended in utter bloodbaths with millions killed or wounded, mountains of corpses left in puddles of mud or frozen in the snow, and legions of dazed refugees wandering the stripped and desolate countrysides where the armies had been. Nicholas and his family were pretty well insulated from the hardships that ordinary Russians were facing. The royal family was consumed with a drama that was playing out in their little world, which the ordinary people of Russia couldn't see very much of. A major factor was the medical condition of Alexis, the heir to the throne. His hemophilia, which nearly killed him on so many occasions that it's miraculous that he lived to the ripe old age of 13. In the 19 teens, there was no real medical treatment available for him of hemophilia or the catastrophic bleeding episodes that it caused. Alexis's mother, the Tsarina Alexandra, was a very devout Russian Orthodox lady. She had converted from Lutheranism when her then fiance, Nicholas, became Tsar of Russia, and she was drawn particularly to the mysticism that sort of orbited the core of Orthodox practice. She was an easy mark for a mystical religious charlatan to take advantage of her. And sure enough, one appeared. The infamous Grigory Rasputin, a holy man or starets, who also claimed to be a faith healer. Rasputin insinuated himself into the royal family through the wives of some of Nicholas's cousins. In 1905, he met the Tsar and Tsarina, who were by then desperate for anyone who could help their son. By laying on hands and various other faith healing tricks, but mostly through the power of suggestion. Rasputin convinced Nicholas and Alexandra that he could indeed control Alexis's bleeding episodes. When a particularly bad one happened in the summer of 1912, Rasputin gave advice to Alexandra by letter and by telephone, and Alexis's bleeding mysteriously stopped. She, even more than her husband, believed in Rasputin's power. When the war broke out, Rasputin was opposed to it, but he also used it to his advantage. This fake holy man was at the center of a web of corruption and debauchery in the Russian Tsarist government. His drinking and sexual escapa escapades were legendary. He may not have been seeking power for its own sake. Maybe he wanted to control things just such that the police and the state basically left him alone to go on drinking binges and commit sexual assault without interference. As more and more scandalous rumors leaked out of the royal palaces, many Russians came to believe that Rasputin was having an affair with the Tsarina or possibly even her daughters, who were teenagers during the war years. There's no evidence of that, but certainly Rasputin was a hated figure among everybody except those people, two people whose opinions counted, Nicholas and Alexandra. In September 1915, after more military reverses, Tsar Nicholas decided to take personal command of the Russian army, and he went to the front to go do it. This left a power vacuum in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Alexandra filled that vacuum, and because she listened to Rasputin, who had long used his influence to meddle in state affairs, he became even more powerful. 
Rasputin had particular interest in who was appointed to high government posts, seeking to get ineffectual nobodies who liked him or at least tolerated him into powerful positions. In 1916, Rasputin badgered Alexandra to appoint a guy named Protopopov, a spineless and unimaginative bureaucrat as Minister of the Interior, who would control the nation's food supply and the secret police. Sure enough, Alexandra wrote letters to her husband whining about this request with the relentlessness of a spoiled kid badgering their parents to get them a particular toy. Nicholas, who was never good at standing up to his wife, caved. Protopopov wound up being a disaster. Within a few months, Russia was crippled by supply shortages and strikes, and mutinies had begun breaking out in some army units. Alarmed at the sudden downward spiral into which Alexandra and Rasputin had launched Russia, Grand Duke Dmitri, Nicholas's cousin, teamed up with a nobleman called Felix Yusupov, the richest man in Russia, to whack Rasputin as a last-ditch emergency effort to save the country and the war effort. In December 1916, Dmitri and Yusupov lured Rasputin to a party room in the basement of one of Yusupov's palaces, the Moika Palace in St. Petersburg, by promising that he, Rasputin, could meet Yusupov's wife, whom he apparently wanted to ravage. What happened next has been told many times, but it has also been disputed. The traditional story, that several attempts to kill Rasputin failed one after the other, such as feeding him poisoned cakes, then poisoned wine, then shooting him, etc., until they finally threw his body to the frozen Neva River, where he eventually drowned. That's the traditional account. However, this account comes entirely from Yusupov's memoirs, published first in 1928. The primary source evidence that we have, namely the autopsy report, shows that it was much less dramatic. Somebody simply shot Rasputin in the head at point blank range, and he died pretty much instantly. They did throw his body in the river, but he was already dead. So, sorry to deflate that fun story. I know, I know, I'm such a buzzkill. Next thing you know, I'll be telling you that Nostradamus didn't predict anything. Tsar Nicholas returned to St. Petersburg, temporarily renamed Petrograd, from the front in the wake of Rasputin's murder to comfort his wife, who, as you imagine, was inconsolable. The Tsar was under tremendous pressure, and he may have had a nervous breakdown about this time. In any event, when he, while he and Alexandra secluded themselves in the palace at Tsarsko Selo, the Russian government continued to disintegrate. During January and February 1917, one by one, what few ministers were left and who still had Nicholas's confidence reported to him that the country was on the brink of revolution and that he had to do something, starting with dismissing Protopopov, which he refused to do until it was too late. In fact, he refused all advice, and in early March, he decided to go back to the military headquarters at the front by train. By this time, shortages of food and fuel for heating were acute all over Russia. Nicholas and Alexandra were oblivious. On March 9, 1917, crowds of hungry people in Petrograd broke open stores and bakeries to loot them for food. Strikes spread across every factory, every industry. Troops and police sympathizing with the demonstrators mostly refused to intervene. From his military train, Nicholas sent a telegram, quote, I order that the disorders in the capital be ended tomorrow. Nobody paid any attention. A few soldiers, remaining reluctantly loyal, shot some demonstrators in Petrograd, and by the end of Sunday, March 11th, over 200 people had been killed, while numerous other companies were mutinied. Nicholas ordered the Duma, the proto-legislature set up after the 1905 revolution, to be suspended, and he decided to return home. Before he got there, the Russian Revolution, which 
had been brewing for almost a hundred years finally took him out. On Monday, March 12th, what remained of Nicholas's loyal army units mutinied. Demonstrators sacked the main armory in Petrograd and passed out weapons. Other public buildings were attacked. Duma, defying the order to disband, met at the Tauride Palace and began taking control of the political situation. But a rival organization, the Soviet of Soldiers and Workers Deputies, better known as the Petrograd Soviet, also established itself in the same palace. A young Duma member, Alexander Kerensky, only 36 years old, skillfully brokered between these two poles of power and prevented an outright power struggle. The new provisional government sent an envoy to the Tsar demanding his abdication. As his train was stalled in the town of Peskov, near the border of Estonia, a group of officers loyal to the new government boarded the train and presented a document for him to sign. On March 15, 1917, Nicholas II officially gave up his crown. Technically, he abdicated in favor of his brother, Grand Duke Michael, rather than his son. But the provisional government, Kerensky in particular, persuaded Grand Duke Michael to renounce that title. After 304 years in power, the Romanov dynasty was officially finished. The first Russian Revolution of 1917 was undoubtedly a momentous event, sweeping away hundreds of years of tradition. But you'll notice a person conspicuously absent from this story, Lenin. He had nothing to do with the March 1917 revolution, and in fact, he was living in exile in Geneva, Switzerland. He read about the revolution in the newspaper. How he eventually got involved, and in fact became the ultimate beneficiary of the revolution, is a whole other story. That is in the next chapter. Since the beginning of the war, the Germans had waged a secret campaign to knock Russia out of the war by encouraging revolution from within. Though they had plenty of factions to choose from, the revolutionary underground in Russia was full of factions and parties that often split from each other. The Germans' favorite was a faction of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, that faction popularly known as the Bolsheviks. Another faction of the same party, the Mensheviks, generally thought of as more moderate and less radical, were the Bolsheviks' counterpoint, constantly competing with them for power. There has long been a controversy over whether Lenin himself was a German agent. It kind of doesn't matter, because after the Tsar was overthrown in March 1917, Lenin received a great deal of help from the German government, who greatly wanted to send him back to Russia in hopes that he'd cause more trouble. In early April 1917, Lenin and the Bolsheviks quickly organized a daring expedition to get from Geneva, Switzerland, where they'd been spending the middle part of the war in exile, back to Petrograd, where they could inject themselves into the tumultuous revolutionary politics of the very shaky post-Tsarist Russian state. The involvement of Germans was necessary in this scheme because the only way to get there involved crossing German and German-held territory. On April 9, 1917, a train left Zurich containing 32 Russians, most, though not all, of them Bolsheviks. The main ones were Lenin and his wife, Kripskaya, who was a revolutionary in her own right, and Grigory Zinoviev. The train traveled under special orders. It was sealed, no one was allowed to get on or off during the two-day journey, and the Germans could not check anybody's passports or papers. There were actually a couple of legs of this journey. It wasn't all on one single train, and part of the route took them over Swedish territory. But on April 16th, the last leg, again by train, ended at the famous Finland station in Petrograd. Lenin and his party received a hero's welcome. The next morning, the German ambassador in Stockholm sent a telegram to the German military headquarters, which read, quote, Lenin's entry into Russia successful. He is working exactly as we would wish." Quote. The provisional government which had taken over in the wake of the Tsar's abdication was weak and uncertain. The original premier was Prince Ilvov, but Kerensky, who was originally Minister of Justice, took over after a few months. The biggest problem with the provisional government and its fatal mistake was that it vowed to continue the war. Most Russians wanted to get out of the war. 
Lenin, from the moment he arrived at Finland Station, called for a worldwide socialist revolution and the overthrow of the provisional government. The Bolsheviks' promises to the people could be summed up in three words that appeared in a lot of their propaganda. Land, peace, bread. In early July, the Bolsheviks tried to take over by force. A group of sailors stationed at the Kronstadt naval base on an island just off the port of Petrograd mutinied and tried to take over the provisional government. Lenin, his new ally Leon Trotsky, and the Bolsheviks may have fomented this rebellion, but certainly they benefited from it. There was fighting in the streets of Petrograd for three days, but the provisional government came out on top. Lenin and Trotsky were even sent into exile again briefly. The key element in Russian politics here was the Petrograd Soviet, which, as you recall, started up at the same time as the provisional government and even in the same building. Whichever faction the Petrograd Soviet supported was essentially going to be the government of Russia. Kerensky had managed to stay on their good side, but it was always a close thing. On August 20th, elections to the Petrograd Soviet resulted in big gains for the Bolsheviks, who finally controlled a bare majority of this body. They also got control of the Moscow Soviet. In early September, another revolt broke out, this one instigated by a former Tsarist general, Kornilov, who Kerensky had formerly put in charge of the provisional government's army. Kornilov had turned against Kerensky and wanted to take over for himself. Astonishingly, the Bolsheviks decided to support the government, which managed to put down the Kornilov revolt. More importantly, though, their support came at the price of Kerensky releasing Bolshevik leaders from prison and allowing them to return from exile. Now that the Bolsheviks controlled the Petrograd Soviet, barely, and the provisional government was hanging by a thread, it was pretty much inevitable that the Bolsheviks would eventually take power. What happened in early November 1917, which the Soviet Union celebrated for the next 74 years as their shining origin moment, was actually pretty unimpressive. It was hardly the sort of popular revolution that happened in March, and I'm a little wary about even titling this chapter Revolution, because it was really sort of more of a coup. So this is how it went down. Upon convening a nationwide meeting of Soviet councils in Petrograd, Lenin decided that the Bolsheviks should take over the major transportation, communications, and utilities in the city. Most of the military units in the city were controlled by Bolshevik officers. Bolshevik sailors also took over a cruiser parked offshore, the Aurora. The provisional government was by now meeting at the Tsar's old winter palace. As elements of the military and government turned against them, what few ministers remained, including Kerensky, essentially barricaded themselves inside the palace and eventually in this very room, the Malachite room. Lenin ordered the phone lines to be cut. A pro-Bolshevik mob gathered outside the palace to deliver the coup de grace. The Aurora and another artillery position on land started shelling the palace. Most of the ministers were arrested. Kerensky, however, managed to escape. When the crowd surged through the Winter Palace, they looted or smashed almost everything of value. Famously, they broke open the Tsar's wine cellar, believed to be the finest wine cellar in the world at that time, and they drank everything. Lenin addressed the Petrograd Soviet and declared that the provisional government had been overthrown. Remember that nationwide meeting of Soviets, the one that the coup had been timed to take advantage of? This was supposed to be a congress of all the revolutionary elements in Russia, and the Bolsheviks did not have a majority in this particular group. Well, when they heard about Lenin's coup, the Mensheviks, and another party called the Social Revolutionaries, walked out of this council in protest, leaving only the Bolsheviks behind. The Bolsheviks quickly used this body to rubber stamp the creation of a new group, the Council of People's Commissars, which elected Lenin as their chairman. It was this organization, the Council of People's Commissars, that formed the nucleus of the Bolshevik government. Technically, the Soviet Union wouldn't be formed for another five years, but the creation of what would be recognized as the Soviet regime dates from the day of this, this body's establishment. November 8, 1917. Still, though, Lenin's hold on power was weak at first. 
When the provisional government organized itself in March 1917, right after the Tsar fell, the idea was that they would be, well, provisional. A temporary democratic government that would run things until the actual permanent government got organized and came online. It was envisioned that a Russian constituent assembly would become the official legislature in early 1918. Elections to this body were held on November 25th, only a couple of weeks after the Bolshevik coup. Lenin's party did not do too well in those elections, winning only about a quarter of the seats up for grabs. The Russian Constituent Assembly, which was not controlled by the Bolsheviks, met on January 18, 1918. Theoretically, nothing should have prevented it from convening and then declaring itself the legitimate government of Russia. Which it, which it would have been if the procedure set up by the provisional government the previous year had actually been followed. It was so obvious that this is what their end game was, and it would have been the end of the Bolshevik government. So, to prevent it, the Bolsheviks floated a resolution that the Constituent Assembly should recognize their rule. Of course, it was soundly rejected. And on this pretext, Lenin ordered the Red Guards to occupy the meeting hall and di dissolved the Constituent Assembly by force. That was truly the Bolsheviks' coup. Indeed, Lenin said, quote, the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly means the complete and open repudiation of the democratic idea in favor of the dictatorship concept, end quote. I mean, he actually admitted that. From that day on, Russia and the broader Soviet Union essentially remained a communist dictatorship until 1991. The first order of business for Lenin, second actually after forming a secret police, the Cheka, to maintain their hold on power, was to get Russia out of the war. When the Allies wouldn't bite at a Bolshevik proposal for a comprehensive peace, Lenin immediately opened separate negotiations with Germany and Austria-Hungary. He and Trotsky, who ended up heading the peace delegation, may have believed that the Germans would go easy on them. After all, they were a friendly power and they had done a lot to get them into power. If they thought this, they were disabused of this notion pretty quickly. The Germans had set a cruel trap for them. The conditions of peace were that the Bolsheviks give away vast amounts of territory that would be set up as new German puppet states. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which the delegates started negotiating in December and signed on March 3, 1918, was essentially dictated by the German general Erich von Ludendorff, now the most powerful man in Germany and co-head with Hindenburg of the German military. The treaty was a bitter pill, but Lenin and Trotsky simply had no choice but to accept it. The Bolshevik regime depended on Germany for its survival, especially since it looked pretty quickly like the Western Allies were going to intervene in the civil war that was brewing, which eventually they did. So with a stroke of a pen, Russia gave away a quarter of its territory, a huge amount of its food producing regions, and 75% of its coal reserves and steel plants. One of the effects of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was that Bolshevik Russia was forced to recognize the independence of Ukraine, which had declared independence shortly after the first 1917 revolution and was actively fighting the Bolsheviks after the second one. Ukraine's independence would not last long. The Bolsheviks eventually absorbed the country during the Russian Civil War. Ukraine declared independence again at the earliest possible moment when the Soviet Union finally collapsed in 1991. Putin's invasion of February 2022 the war that, and the war that continues today is an attempt to reverse that event. Russia's second such attempt in the past 105 years. While the first Russian Revolution of 1917 was brewing, and before there was much prospect of knocking Russia out of the war, Germany was getting pretty desperate. Nothing it had tried on the Western Front managed to move the needle. There were economic and manpower shortages in Germany, and the military, which had promised Kaiser Wilhelm II victory, simply couldn't deliver it. 
With very few tricks left up their sleeves, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who by 1917, as I said, were the de facto leaders of Germany, decided to turn the whole unrestricted submarine warfare thing, which they had shut down in the spring of 1915 after protests by the United States, back on. This was something of a gamble. The generals knew that letting submarines target shipping and headed for Britain again would probably cause the United States to declare war eventually. But in 1917, the United States had a very tiny army. It would take a year, the Germans thought, for Woodrow Wilson to raise an army of any significant numbers, and it would take another year, or at least several more months, for them to get that army over to Europe, where it could make any sort of difference on the battlefield. The German generals thought, or, or were at least willing to gamble, that their submarines could starve the British out of the war before all of that happened. Of course, the United States did declare war on April 2nd, 1917, only a couple of weeks after the first Russian Revolution. President Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war on Germany, which Congress delivered four days later. Only a tiny trickle of American troops showed up in France before the end of 1917, but in November, the Germans got one of their Hail Mary wishes with the Bolshevik coup that ultimately led to Russia leaving her former allies in a lurch. Especially after the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, Germany had now only one front in the West to worry about. The Germans thought this was awesome. Here at last was their chance to win the war. Now it was down to logistics shuttle all the forces they had in the east back over to France, beef up the German armies there, and mount a huge offensive that would finally break through and enable them to take Paris. Then it would be all over. What could possibly go wrong? Well, of course, it didn't turn out to be quite that simple. On March 21st, 1918, the Germans launched their great offensive. The generals promised Kaiser Wilhelm that this was finally it, the decisive moment. At first, the German troops in the West did make big gains, but Allied counterattacks reversed many of them, especially a French attack that resulted in the Second Battle of the Marne. Backed up now by American supplies and resources, the Allies could replenish their losses. The Germans couldn't. They had nothing more to send. The big gamble had failed. Because of the Americans, the Germans really didn't have the opportunity to try again. There was a ticking clock this time. Wilson had managed to raise an army, and Allied military planners had figured out a, a way to get the massive new American army to France, where it could finally make a difference. Part of the logistics involved turning several huge, fast ocean liners, which Britain and France had, and the Germans didn't, into troop transports, hauling massive numbers of butts from the U.S. East Coast to ports in France. About a year ago, I did a video specifically on that subject, how ocean liners helped the Allies win World War I. If, after this immensely long video, you still can't get enough, check it out. By summer 1918, American troops had begun to appear everywhere on the Western Front, with more and more streaming down the gangplanks every week. Slowly, the fresh American manpower started to turn the tide on the battlefield in favor of the Allies. On August 8, 1918, the Allies began a massive offensive of their own with a series of surprise attacks. The Germans were finally on the run. The converted ocean liners also brought something else from the U.S. over to Europe. A virulent new strain of influenza appeared in the U.S. Midwest in early 1918. The influenza invariably made its way to the training camps and then the transport ships and then the front lines. The first wave of the pandemic in the spring and early summer was bad, but the second dwarfed it which reached its peak in the fall just as the war was ending. Like the pandemic that would sweep the world a bit more than a century later, the mortality of what was then called erroneously the Spanish flu was exacerbated by social factors. Mask resistance, misinformation, denial, conspiracy theories, and the failure of medical authorities to limit its spread as effectively as they could have done. It's impossible to count how many people died from the flu, but some estimates put it as high as 100 million, vastly dwarfing the death toll from the war itself. Death was everywhere in 1918. And as the war itself started to reach a conclusion, the remaining monarchies didn't have much time left. Thank you. 
On November 1, 1918, American flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker flew over the front lines in northern France. He said, quote, every road was filled with retreating heinies. They were going while the going was good. Does the Delta Rune anniversary mean anything? Indicate that for them, what do you it mean? It was indeed. Apparently it's tomorrow. I mean, if they might announce something. Oh, they have a new newsletter. Let's see what this is. What the heck? It's addressed to me! This letter is addressed to Ivan GS. I'm curious. Oh no, there's a spooky ghost dog! It's adorable. Deltarune Chapter 3 Progress. Content complete! They mentioned that the bullet seemed kind of hard. I nodded and forgot about this feedback immediately. Uh, they're working on chapter four already. Game release strategy. Uh, my original plan was to release three, four, and five together. However, chapter five is pretty far off, and I don't think anybody wants <laughs> me to wait that long to release anything, especially me. So chapter three and four is what we're leaving next. All right. That seems to be seems to be it. What if I shot Drakes with a crossbow, though? You would complete your Slayer task. True and real, perhaps. Hello. Oh, hello. How are you, Pat? Did you get your severance yet? I did. Oh, okay, good. Did you gamba at all? I did. <laughs> did you win? I did. No, you didn't. I won 800 bucks. No, you didn't. Shut nice. up. Nice. How much did you spend to win that 800 bucks, though? 900 bucks? No, I... Checkmate. I mean, you said profit at 800. No way. I told Talon there's no way you would profit. I said you would profit, Pat. He did. Okay, he probably used a number bigger than that, but I have no idea what amounts you gambling anyway, so... You bet the family farm. Did you get your formal offer yet? Uh, yeah. I mean, like, I'm signing documents and shit, so... Nice. Do you know when you'll start? You got more time? The 13th. Well, I don't know, because some, some of the paperwork's taking a little bit more time. They want 10 years of employment history. That and seems there's weird. Just, there's just a lot of, sh like, documents that I just don't have from that long ago. Yeah. It's like, uh... Usually they just want your last place, right? Like... Yeah, uh, that's, kind of weird. that's weird. Cringe. Yeah, it is definitely cringe. They already extended you an offer, like... <laughs> Seems like they should have already looked into all that and stuff. They were gonna. They're gonna figure out that you're no good in Lava Lana 2 Randomizer. This is the guy who quit first. Oh! Pat! Important! What? Breaking news! Did you know Talus Principle's coming out in like two yeah, days? You... I think you mentioned it. It's like very soon. It might be, it might be on Friday. But you you enjoyed your you played the first right? Obviously yeah, you enjoyed it if you played it. I think I don't remember. November second. What day is that? That's Thursday. Well, I'm dying. Drink an anti-fire. There we go. Chuck, 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 chuck. Um. 
Nice. So you're gonna play it, right? I'm gonna play it. I guess. The Talus Principle One is probably one of my favorite puzzle games of all time. Uh, it might be my favorite puzzle game of all time. I, I don't know. Like, I think the thing I love about it is that it made really complicated puzzles with like just very straightforward rules. Like, nothing about any of the mechanics was cryptic. It was just really complicated permutations of things. And I was like, you know what? This is great. Putting boxes on things, shooting lasers at de jammers at doors. That's that's all I need in my life. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited. Colin's not going to play it, but I guess he'll watch us play it. Dude, I really hope it has door jammers. I, door jammers were my favorite. I mean, they were like at the very start of the first game. Sure, sure, like, they'll be back. I love door jamming. Anyway, there's that. Are you doing anything for hollowed ween? Hollowed weenus? Nope. Me neither. Oh, we were just talking about Deltarune. Toby Fox says Chapter 3 is done, and he's going to release at the end of Chapter 4, not 5. So... Maybe next year! <laughs> maybe next year, bud! Dude, fuck Chimera. Chimera? Chimera. Ah, it sounds like he's doing the mini bosses in Lama Lama 2. Mm. That area you were stuck in. Just use your, uh, use your suit, bro. <laughs> I haven't killed most of them with the garb, it's true. Yeah, the only thing I... The, the, the reason I quit is because I, I can't... I can't beat the crab without any sort of projectile sub weapon, but... Uh, everything else... Didn't you have, like, rolling shuriken did or something? Not really, I didn't have enough. Mm. But, uh... I mean, I could have gotten it with the suit if I wanted to spend hours and hours on it. I just want to spend hours and hours on it. Like, I had a strategy that would work. It would just need, like, a hundred hits or something. And I could only hit it, like, twice a cycle. If I was lucky. Denise Damgaard, end quote. The powerful German military had crumbled. Since late September, the top generals, realizing they were going to be defeated, had been casting around for a way to end the war. The most promising option, politically, was an armistice based on the idea of President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, an idealistic document that he'd come up with in January 1918, suggesting an international order based on freedom, openness, and fairness. Even the other allies, especially Britain and France, didn't think very much of the 14 points, but at the bitter end, the Germans thought it was about the best they could hope for, if Wilson could make it stick. On October 14th, though, Wilson issued a note that suggested strongly that no peace would be concluded with Germany without the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II and the end of the German monarchy. Even this wasn't the deciding factor, though. Socialist rebellions and mutinies were popping up all over Germany, especially in the Navy. German socialists and communists, hoping to replicate the Bolshevik revolution on German soil, organized and agitated. They thought their time shield. had come. On November 7th, while the German generals were still dithering about what kind of terms they should accept from the Allies, a former journalist named... Which Kurt one are you Eisen struggling with? The, the skull? No. Is it the three spinning head ones? Which, which one is it? Because I guarantee you the answer is shoot laser beams at.
I have 3 HP. It's more than enough. How much more do you- how much more HP does one need? Probably none. None more HP. Oh, I forgot. Scroll. There's another phase to this boss. The- the donuts? No, the three-headed, uh... Yeah, yeah, she shoots donuts though, right? Yeah, she shoots them. Yeah, yeah, she can't hit you if you're- if you just get in I'm the lasering. suit. Yeah. Organized a mass meeting at the Munich fairgrounds, where Oktoberfest was in progress. Soldiers from nearby garrisons joined the demonstrations, and revolutionaries began to occupy post offices and buildings. By the evening of that day, a workers' Soviet had been set up, and they proclaimed the German state of Bavaria a socialist republic. Ludwig III, the king of Bavaria, a junior monarch to the Kaiser, obviously, packed up his family and fled the palace almost immediately. Over the next oh, he, days, you can almost kill him with a laser before he jumps at all. Or before he, like, um, goes invincible and starts jumping off the screen. I, mean, yeah, he... I can't get through his room. There go. Okay, so numerous other princes and sub monarchs of the German Wait, states into the... fled into exile or gave up their the throne. The king doesn't spawn until you kill everyone. Now, right? the Kaiser was not Correct. budging for the time being, but most of the rest of the German royals were already throwing in the towel. On November 8th, German military leaders began it meeting be with like French back, generals but... in a train. There's either a way back or a way forward. You have to kill like certain subsets together. Yeah. This elevator should be working, but it's not. Weird. Oh, okay. I have to go back one more screen. Car in Copenhagen, in France, to discuss armistice terms. Meanwhile, socialist revolution was breaking out all over Germany. Prince Max von Baden, the Chancellor of Germany, met with the politician who he thought was Let's most see. likely to save Germany from the communists, Friedrich Ebert, the leader of the Social Democratic Party. If I go to Spa, said the Chancellor, Spa was the estate where the Kaiser was holed up, and obtain the abdication of the Kaiser, can I count on your support? in the fight Delphine. against social revolution. Ebert responded, I don't want social revolution. I hate it like sin. Various officials and the Kaiser's own son pleaded with him to <laughs> abdicate. Gradually, so. they talked him down to agreeing to abdicate as German emperor, but not as king of Prussia. Prince Max von Baden, though, was either under the mistaken impression that the Kaiser had already abdicated, or else he just jumped the gun on his own authority. But he publicly announced the Kaiser's complete abdication on November 9th, 1918. He relinquished his powers to Ebert, and at that moment, Germany became a republic. The Hohenzollern monarchy ended. At 4.30 on the morning of Sunday, November 10th, the Kaiser boarded his private train at Spa, which quickly and quietly took him out of Germany and to the Dutch border. He didn't sign a formal instrument of abdication for several more weeks until November 25th, but for all practical Face. intents and purposes, it was all over. German Empire... Oh, is she, is she small? Oh, no, you know, you're fighting... So the system. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, AKA the e easy mode. Alright, how do I fight this? Had lasted 40 you, lasers. You very easily kill it with lasers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on, Pat. This guy doesn't believe in laser supremacy. Don't ask me how you beat the crab, though. I hope you have a gun. I do have a gun. Okay. I would just gun the crab. <laughs> I have Earth Speed. This is a new series, by the way. But the whole Wait, what? Yeah, you made it. Started, a... started over? Why? Well, you weren't playing, so I was just like, you know, I, I randomized the, randomized the entrance as an Ah. So you're almost done already, though. Uh, I don't even have double jump. Oh. 
but I have then why are you there <laughs> okay so I don't have double jump killed four I killed four bosses okay had been ruling some part of Germany or another. Is it a much better seed other than not having double jump? No. No. <laughs> Still suffering. Um, I had to. I had to go to. Um, space. To get yeah. snapshots. Now oh, that's awkward. How do you do an immune line? You just laser? Shoot him with lasers, yeah. If I crouch in this corner, you can't hit me with this charge. Hmm, I didn't know that. Alright, I think I do this clue scroll, and then don't do the last of the drinks tonight. We'll save those for tomorrow. We only got 30 drinks left to kill. Nice yelp. He, I jumped and he hit me. Imagine, imagine jumping. You will have no time for drinks tomorrow. You'll be very busy. I better not be. We better one shot it. It's the last. Let's go out with fond memories to, to make up for Prinny's suffering. You don't understand his suffering. Sorry, Prinny has double COVID. He'll have triple COVID brain tomorrow. Pat, Prinny's been trying to do like a 1 out of 512 drop in RuneScape. And he's killed 2,800. And he got the drop and his internet cut out. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. He's he's actually suffering right now. Like, in, intense, intense suffering. That's like a... That's like a it's like a whatever grind too. Like it should go pretty fast, but he's five. He's five times over. Uh, it took me maybe like an hour. Not 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 even. I don't think. He's been there for like almost a week. Just playing a fucking slide puzzle. Yeah, welcome to Clue Scrolls. Where I assemble pictures of trolls. Thanks, bro. Give me my Clue Scroll. Where am I going next? CIP. <sighs> Deep wilderness and you have to bring all your items. Wrong. Bro. Yo, speaking of wildy, that uh, that battle axe I got—it's good for the wildy skeleton boss. Might be, might be time to skeleton soon. Meet me in the wilderness, and I'll trim your new axe and all of your Z9 gems. Oh, I don't have any Z9 gems anymore. I have Z9 shards. 
Sorry, you can't I'll trim, trim those. those. No, uh, yes, I can. No, yes, I can. No, yes, I can. No, 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 no. I have lots of seat trim. I have all forms of seat night trimming. Wrong. Which one's the Champions Guild? The Legend Guild. Oh, it's the one in freaking. Okay. It's the one in Barthrop. So I think the closest one. Yeah, I guess it's just going to Barthrop. That all ended in November 1918. At exactly the same time, the last great European monarchy, the Habsburg dynasty, was also disintegrating. Karl I, the successor to Fran Emperor Franz Joseph, as Emperor of Austria Hungary, he had also been toying this is the with the idea of an armistice Frick, the based champions? on Woodrow Wilson's 14 oh, points. Is that the one in Verac? But he came up against the same stumbling block that Wilhelm had. The president seemed to insist on the emperors giving up their crowns before the shooting stopped. In October, Karl had been forced to give in to the demands of the yeah, Hungarian parts this, of his uh, empire for total treasure room. With the one that uh, grab on the pillars. And, Thing? And Lombolano one where you can only have one chance to do it. Yeah, well that one you also only have one chance, I believe. No. Nope. What do you mean no? I don't think the room resets, does it? Trolley's Mountain. Oh god, is that the where I think it is? Yeah. self-government. Hungary orb. was proclaimed a federal orb. state. Essentially, it seceded That's from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This unleashed a chain reaction of various other ethnic peoples in the former empire to go their own ways, too. A union of Czechia and Slovakia had already been recognized by the Allies earlier in 1918, but soon they made it formal. Throughout October, representatives of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes were meeting in Zagreb to form the Pan-Slavic Union that numerous people, including Gavrilo Princip, had been dreaming of for years, Yugoslavia. On October 15th, a group of Polish officials told the government in Vienna that they considered themselves no longer part of the empire. Indeed, now here's the supreme irony, even the ethnic Austrians in Austria-Hungary decided they wanted their own self-determination separate from everyone else. Basically, over the course of about two months, the old empire of Austria-Hungary exploded into a whole bunch of new countries. Karl, the last Habsburg emperor, did not abdicate, but it was still over for him. On November 11th, day of the armistice, Karl and his family snuck out of Schönbrunn Palace in two ordinary taxi cabs and left for a castle a few miles outside of Vienna. By then, the armistice had been announced and there were crowds in the streets of Vienna cheering about the end of the war and they completely missed the escape of the royal family. The new government of Austria formally banned the Habsburg monarchy a few months later and they banished any member of the family from ever setting foot on Austrian soil unless they renounced all claims to nobility. In two die. monarchies, the Hohenzollerns and the Habsburgs, ended on nice. two successive days, November 10th and 11th, 1918. At 11 o'clock a.m. on November 11th, the armistice went into effect, the guns in France fell silent, and World War I was officially over. For Germany, though, it was out of the frying pan and into the fire for several months from November 1918 until well into 1919. The shaky new democratic government of Germany battled for survival against socialist and Bolshevik-leaning revolutionary groups. There was heavy street fighting in Berlin and other cities. Now, the twists and turns of the attempted German socialist revolution don't Ooh, really concern us. Quaff. I wanted that quaff. I remember this one. Anyone else quaffed? No. 
있습니다. I guess I'll do a bird house run before I sign off, but I'm dead. Hi, dead. I'm Ivan.
advisory.